your full Royal Rumble review. And Monday Night Raw is coming up in just a minute. And boy, do we have a lot of content to get through today. Over About two and a half hours with my co-hosts as I brought on Mary Grater, Zach Perez, and Anthony DeMarco to cover the entire Royal Rumble show from top to bottom. Uh, the women's Royal Rumble match, the men's. All the matches that happened, including the pre-show, and then, of course, touching on the big, 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 big events that happened on Monday Night Raw with, of course, Randy Orton's Attack on Edge. So um, you're not going to want to miss this one. This is a marathon show, guys. You may want to break this down into uh, you know just a couple of days unless you have some significant time to get through this. But um, this is one you're going to want to listen to. It's it's the, definitely the longest show in the history of this show, but it is worth listening to as we cover all bases. And you get all perspectives, and we didn't always agree on everything, which is a good thing. Um, so stay tuned for your full Rumble review and Monday Night Raw thoughts right after this. You're listening to the WWE Podcast. We'll be right back after this short break. Hey guys, so retirement may or may not be something that you're really thinking about, but even if you are years and years away, I mean, I'm 20 years away from retirement, but it's something that we should all be thinking about. There's a company that has retirement plans that you can invest in precious metals like gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. There's also a big opportunity to grow retirement and grow income for either your personal or, um, or a business. And anyone who signs up at this website receives a free investment kit and gift. So what is this website? It's brightmoneyinvestments.com. That's brightmoneyinvestments.com. You can diversify and grow with metals and cryptos, and you can even talk to someone there to get a better idea of what you should be investing in. So head on over to brightmoneyinvestments.com. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. The most passionate and authentic wrestling analysis on the web. We've got you covered with every Raw, SmackDown, and NXT show. Giving you a no bullshit opinion. We know you love wrestling. We do too. So let's get this show underway. And that's the bottom line. What? Because Stone Cold Simpson! Welcome, guys, to the WWE Podcast. Huge, huge show today. Uh, tonight, or today, depending on when you're listening to this, all co-hosts on board. Uh, and we have a full Rumble review for you, including the uh, the Edge return, of course, headlining the Royal Rumble news. Drew McIntyre, you could argue, is also kind of in that top spot, winning the Men's Royal Rumble match. Uh, Brock Lesnar being eliminated by Drew McIntyre. We covered everything, every angle that you probably could in terms of uh, the Royal Rumble, uh, the Royal Rumble outcome, and where we could be go- could be going into WrestleMania, potential WrestleMania matches. Who Charlotte Flair could be challenging, right? I mean, she said on Raw that she was going to face a champion. Well, hint, hint. There are three championships for the women. Keep that in mind. Um, so we, we really covered everything that you could probably imagine. I'm sure we've missed some stuff, but uh, it really was a, a very thorough review of Royal, the Royal Rumble. And you got different perspectives from four different people on the Rumble and, uh, of course, the Monday Night Raw after the Rumble, um, which really felt like a WrestleMania Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania, didn't it? It, it felt huge. Um, but... Great show. You guys are going to want to keep this on a uh, really on a, kind of a pause and, and play and repeat and, and continue because this is a long show. This is, uh, you know, two and a half plus hours of content. And that's a good thing if you guys like long shows. Um, and so maybe we'll continue to do this kind of like a pay-per-view round table uh, post show type of deal. Uh, I know other big podcasts have that. I'm not trying to rip off the name from anybody, but that's truly what it would be. And that what this was, uh, we were, just shooting the you know what, just talking about the pay per view and giving our thoughts on it, and uh, went around the invisible table that we had, and uh, everyone got a turn to talk, and it you know it, it turned out very well, and I really hope that we were able to do this do this again, and uh, maybe mix up some co hosts and bring other people on, and maybe have a, a discussion with 
Different groups for different pay-per-views. I don't know. We'll see. This is kind of a trial run. I've never had this big of a group of co-hosts to discuss wrestling, but it's always a blast. And boy, two and a half hours go super quick when you talk wrestling. Um, but uh, anyway, guys, thank you for joining me. This is the WWE Podcast. Um, you can join me every day. Every single day, this show has a new show. Um, a, a new one comes out every day, and it's not always by me. Um, it's by our lovely co-hosts or um, by our uh, hosts with Chris, who does NXT, or with Zach, who does AEW, or Aiden Willis, our newest member to the show, who will cover Monday nights and give alternate perspectives on the current product. Um, Aiden is uh, is is coming to us, and I would well, like to welcome, and I hope you guys give him a listen as well. He had a Royal Rumble uh, prediction show, and also had his own thoughts on if WrestleMania should be a two day event. So that was published on our feed uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, actually, no, it was published yesterday. I'm losing track of time. It is very late and past my bedtime right now, but. Um, with that being said, welcome him, give him, uh, give him a listen, give him a like, uh, give him a follow, subscribe to this feed. If you would like to continue to hear him, Chris, Zach, Mary, uh, Ashley, Anthony, all of the, the entire team here on the WWE podcast. So, uh, the team's growing. It's a good thing. And this is now an officially, officially a daily show. It's insane, right? It's, it's nuts, but, uh, that's what this is now. So, uh, all right, guys, let's uh, let's not waste any time. Let's get to the good stuff, right? Let's get to Mary. Let's get to Zach. Let's get to Anthony. And of course, let's get to myself as we talk about the Royal Rumble and the running at Raw after. I'll be back tomorrow with part two of the uh, Stone Cold versus The Rock wrestling nostalgia as we look at WrestleMania 17, one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time and one of the greatest men events of all time of Stone Cold versus The Rock for the WWF Championship. Stone Cold turns heel. You're going to get all my thoughts on that. So part two is tomorrow. You're not going to want to miss that. And then on uh, Thursday and Friday, NXT, AEW, Saturday and Sunday, we are back with your weekend review. So a lot, a lot, a lot to cover as we just go full steam ahead into WrestleMania season. This is certainly going to be a busy one. It's going to be a noteworthy one. We've already got uh, a massive return, one that gave me chills to the bone, and I've seen about 20 times. And I'm telling you, that edge return was something that I will never forget. Um, I, I heard, we all heard rumors of circulating that he's coming back, uh, that he's you know been cleared to compete. And even knowing that, still hearing his music and hearing the crowd reaction, that was a stone cold return type of reaction. Seeing Edge's face come out. The, the look in his eyes when he came out is really what told the story, and it was just amazing. Everything about that was just magic. It was damn magic seeing Edge come back and, and, and vindicate himself, and he looks in amazing shape. He's, he's just, uh, I, I can't say enough about the return. Uh, it, was, it was just damn brilliant, and obviously having Drew McIntyre win, well, you'll hear our thoughts about that as well. So I just wanted to touch on that. All right, well, guys. Let's uh, let's get right to it. Let's get to the audio, get to the conversation with all four of us and uh, wrestling talk, which is what you're here for. So, uh, guys, I will talk to you soon. Who's it going to be? He's the king of it. That is, guys, my favorite moment in WWE in the last, I don't know, five, ten years. Probably since the CM Punk uh, promo that happened in Vegas. 
That was the moment for me. Welcome, guys, to the Royal Rumble and Raw Review Show. Um, I'm, I've been really looking forward to having this conversation with you guys. I've been holding a lot of stuff in, as you guys have for the last two days with with the last two shows. And uh, we now have Anthony DeMarco. We have Mary Grader. And subbing in for Ashley uh, this time around is Zach Perez. Guys, welcome to the show. It's awesome to have everybody here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to be here. Absolutely glad to be here. So, guys, I'm just going to ask you right off the top. I'm, uh, Mary, I'll start with you. Um, what What were your overall thoughts of the Rumble and Raw? Well, I mean, what did you give it a thumbs up? Was it thumbs in the middle, thumbs down? Where were you for the just as a whole? Um, well, starting with the Rumble, I think it's the best Rumble that I've seen since I started watching wrestling again back in 2011, 2012. Um, it's up there, too. I don't know if it's the greatest Rumble of all time. I'm not saying that. But the card was super solid. I wasn't really happy with the outcome of the Women's Rumble, but the, the Women's Rumble overall was super good. And then, you know, they delivered on the men's rumble and even all the matches, the only one that was kind of eh was the Bailey match, which I didn't really expect that much from it. Um, I expected the outcome, but in general it, it moved, it didn't like lag and it seemed like it was a solid card overall in my opinion. Um, as far as raw goes, it was a good follow-up raw. I mean, things happen. They started building storylines going to WrestleMania, but I mean, it was, it was a decent raw. It wasn't terrible in any, any means, but you know, it's. I think it depends on the person and what they're they're paying attention to and the storylines that they're invested in. So I didn't have any problems with Raw last night either. Zach, what did you think? Yeah, overall, I think that the the Royal Rumble was a great card. It's definitely one of the better Rumbles that I've watched in a long time, and it really hit on all the right spots for me for what I feel like the Royal Rumble should be. You know, it had a good amount of surprises, uh, good matches in between to break up the Women's Royal Rumble and the Men's Royal Rumble, and I think that ultimately the decisions they made really made a lot of sense. I was really happy to see them kind of go the right direction and give it to Drew McIntyre. As much as I would have kind of liked to see Edge take his way all the way through the Rumble, I, I did like the idea of having it end up with Drew McIntyre or Claymore to Lesnar. And I, I just thought a lot of the big moments were done so right, and I thought they did a brilliant job of kind of showcasing the best of what the Royal Rumble can be. So I was definitely really happy with it, and I like to see that they're continuing things along on Raw with uh, Edge still coming back, and even seeing MVP back, too, was nice to see on Raw. So a lot of cool things happening in WWE, very retro feels. Anthony? Uh, best Rumble, hands down, in probably 15 years. The last Rumble I could compare to as good as this is 2005 when Batista won it. But, yeah, just great booking decisions across the board. Every match was enjoyable for the most part. And the Rumble itself, like, you know, that's the best possible course of action you could have taken with Brock Lesnar being first. It told the story. It was like almost a tale of two Rumbles. The, the interaction between Brock and Drew with the ultimate elimination of Brock, I've rewatched about five or six times. The pop was amazing. They built Drew McIntyre to be a beast. They swerved me at the end. I was convinced it was going to be Roman Reigns, but I was hoping for Drew McIntyre turning babyface. And then continued on Raw, they planted some seeds with McIntyre and Brock being official for WrestleMania. Now we have this Edge and Randy Orton thing. And what can you say about the Edge return? I haven't heard a pop that big uh, since The Rock came back in 2011. And to be honest, this one may have been bigger because this was for an actual match. So I got to tip my hat to WWE. That was the best pay-per-view in easily the last 10 to 15 years. It's crazy. I mean, it felt like WrestleMania to me. It felt like I just came off WrestleMania. And the Raw from last night felt like a Raw after Mania, except it was a Raw after the Rumble. And I don't know if it's because they're starting to move to stadiums because with, for the Royal Rumble, and rightfully so. That edge entrance, I'm serious. Like uh, this, Those are moments that remind you why you're a wrestling fan. Those are the moments that you look back on. And, and like when you get goosebumps, and I was laying in my bed, and my son and my wife were asleep, and I, w I had my headphones on. And I hear Edge's music, and like I jumped up, and I'm like, I had to hold in my yell. 
And because if obviously I did, I would have caught hell for it because then I would have woke up the entire family. But I, like that's how I, I, emotional I felt about it. Even though I heard rumors and there was some strong speculation, you just still never know. And hearing that for me was – it was one of those moments that – like I'm not kidding you. And I've seen – I've watched this like 20 times of, of his introduction back into the Rumble. And when you see Edge's eyes when he's coming down the ramp, that's really what tells the story to me. It's, it's, it's as if he is coming full circle, that he's back, and that – all of the emotion in the build and what what uh, was taken away from him nine years ago is coming full circle. It just there's so much emotion there in those few seconds of that camera shot of him coming down the ramp. Uh, it was it was awesome. The rest of the card, um, I, I really enjoyed the top to bottom. You could say the Bailey match was a little bit subpar. It it kind of was. I mean, I guess in comparison, especially to the rest of the card, even even the pre uh, the, the pre show with Sheamus and Shorty G, right? I mean, we can we can discuss that uh, in a few moments as well. But and Andrade too. Andrade uh, retaining the United States Championship, even though he got a 30 day suspension, and we can talk about that as well. I loved this Royal Rumble. Like you said, this may have been WWE's best pay-per-view in a decade. That's insane to say, but it really may have been. I, I totally agree. Um, going back to the Edge stuff real quick, um, you know, there have been rumors for months that he got cleared and stuff, and I loved how they did it where, you know, sometimes when a, a surprise entrant comes in, they kind of like have a pause. You know, there there's nothing, no, nobody's music hit. But they hit it right away, and that place just exploded. And it wasn't even like, oh, this superstar is back. Uh, we're super excited about it. Like, everybody was just genuinely happy for him because when he retired, you saw how heartbroken he was. Same thing happened with Daniel Bryan, but even even more so with Edge. Just the way that he had to go out, he was champ and he was forced and they told him he would never wrestle again. And he had serious, serious injuries. And that shows you how far the medical field has come, I mean, as a whole. But like you're saying, when they closed up on his face and you could see the tears welling in his eyes because he couldn't believe that he was there. He couldn't believe that he was there and he couldn't believe that he got that reaction, even though I don't understand why he wouldn't think he would get that reaction. I mean, Edge is the best. He's one of the best that, you know, has come in the ring personality wise and everything that he's done for the tag team division and as a champion and pushing, you know, the envelope. But it was it was just one of those surreal moments, like you say, when this is why we watch and you could just see the raw emotion in his face, like just taking it all in and trying not to like get up and caught and be like, okay, I got to go in there and, and show that I still got it, which he did. I mean, he was in the final four. I mean, how awesome was that? But it was just, it was one of those moments when you go, this is why I'm a wrestling fan because I'm actually happy. I, I feel his happiness right now because this is his dream. And even though I've never been a wrestler, like I can understand if something was taken away from me, unexpectedly and not on my own terms and I was able to get it back and I I busted my ass to get it back it was it was just a phenomenal moment and I loved how they executed it it was amazing yeah I I definitely agree with you too that I I think that that was one of those moments where you could kind of feel him looking into the lens of the camera as if he was looking into the eyes of all of the fans and to have him kind of experience that not only for himself but to experience it with everybody in the audience like that it was it was very powerful and I think that his emotion conveyed a lot uh, through the camera lens and it just made for one of those uh, huge uh, you'll go back and watch moments, uh, and I feel like I've watched him in the uh, TLC matches with the Hardy Boys and the Dudley Boys a million times. Now I'm going to end up uh, basically wearing out my phone screen watching this video so many times. It's just one of those surreal moments where you really feel like it, it's a great experience having been a wrestling fan for a long time and having watched his journey to get there. You just felt a part of it. Well, what makes it so special in my mind is because you had the Edge return, and it was amazing, one of the best returns of all time. Everyone exploded, but it wasn't just the Edge return that made the Rumble what it was. I can't stress enough how amazing of a booking decision I think booking Drew McIntyre to win the Royal Rumble was. You know, up until maybe two years ago when Shinsuke Nakamura won, 
you know, WWE was not on a great run with Royal Rumble, so, you know, picking Triple H and Batista as Roman Reigns as past winners that were often rejected by the crowd. But now, you know, they pick a guy who the crowd is clearly behind, who has a lot of untapped potential. You know, the women's Royal Rumble was fantastic. You know, maybe the, the outcome could be debated a bit, but the match itself was great. I love the Fiend versus Daniel Bryan. I thought that told a good story. The follow-up on Raw was great. So, even though Edge, Edge's return was just fantastic, it didn't completely make the show. It was nice that we didn't solely have to rely on Edge coming back. That just was like a cherry on top. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the fact is that Drew McIntyre was the right choice, and I got a little nervous at the end, and certainly flashes of 2015 came rushing back for Roman Reigns with the reaction he got. I mean, rightfully so, eliminating Edge and everything. And I was, I, I had that feeling that if WWE puts Roman Reigns in the final few, that he's going to get that reaction. And, and lo and behold, he did. And I think that um, putting Drew McIntyre over was the correct choice. And I didn't pick him. I still, I, I, I did not. I mean, I, I was, I was wrong. And I thought there was a chance. I thought he was a dark horse. But f honestly, for the last few months, he's kind of been in, under the surface, kind of a tweener. And he won the big triple threat match on Raw, and that was really the only ground he had to stand on. And then got RKO by Randy Orton the next week. So, to me, there wasn't a whole lot of signals that, yeah, this is who we're going with. And so I didn't think that they would pull the trigger, but I thought if they did, that the crowd would respond positively. And my God, did you hear the reaction when he eliminated Brock Lesnar? As you had said, Anthony, that really was a tale of two rumbles. And you had Brock Lesnar dominating the beginning of the ma uh, match, which I actually did think would happen, which makes sense because whoever eliminates Brock would then be would get a huge rub from that. That would point the direction of, okay, it's probably going to be Brock versus whoever eliminates him, which many people thought, and it was a great story. People were getting pissed off. Oh, my God, this is the worst rumble ever. I saw the tweets. People are going nuts. I'm like, do you know what's going to happen here? They're building to a moment. They're building to whoever eliminates Brock is going to be that guy he, they're gonna he's they're gonna be that person that faces Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania that's what they're building to and people are getting genuinely angry I thought it was brilliant and the pop that he got for eliminating Brock Lesnar was probably rivaled Edge's entrance I mean it was that loud people were going nuts but it was a great story great ending it, it really may have been and I know that it's simply because it's my the most recent thing sometimes is the most vibrant thing so you think it's the most intense but I guess sitting here on January 28th 2020 I would say that may have been the top in my top two or maybe the top Royal Rumble I've ever seen in my life I mean it was brilliantly booked from top to bottom um I mean I don't I don't know that because you're saying like going in retrospect I, it's definitely top 10 top five I I totally agree with that and and to go off of what Anthony said everything he said was right it wasn't that just Edge returned. Um, Drew McIntyre was the person that I said should win. I said Brock or Roman was going to win because I thought that was the safe bet and WWE logic. But I said Drew should win because you need to make new stars. And he is believable for taming the beast. Um, he, the story, everybody getting mad about Brock don't understand Brock. These are the people who don't understand the concept between them doing a part-time champ and it throws back to the old days that this is the guy Brock has been the dominant champion for what five years plus now he loses it for like a couple of months and then he gets it back I was laughing the whole first of the rumble because I love when Brock goes in there and just destroys people yes. I think it's funny it's hysterical but it gives him legitimacy we can go back to when Brock came back and they almost screwed it up by him losing to John Cena and Triple H. They almost messed it up. But since those two losses, he has been the most dominant guy in the men's division as a world champion. And he should be because look at him. And he's a collegiate athlete. You have to make him believable. There's not a lot of believable stuff like that anymore. And I've always said the person who's going to take out Brock has to be believable that he's going to take him out. It can't be a Mysterio. It can't be like, I mean, sorry, it can't be a CM Punk. Like somebody like Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe and a Drew McIntyre who is just a slab of man. I hate to like be like, like that guy is just 
like he's huge and he's beefy and that's what he is. It is believable to me that Drew McIntyre can be the guy to take out the beast. And it was just smart booking. And on the other side, they saved Roman's butt because if they did have Roman win again, he would have gotten booed out of the building and they already made that mistake and they've worked so hard to get Roman back to a point where he still gets mixed kind of, you know, responses and stuff, but he's really not getting booed anymore. So there was nothing for Roman. If Roman would have won, he wouldn't have benefited it at all. Like Roman can get a title shot. It's kind of like what my argument will be about the woman's uh, outcome rumble. But the people who are saying that Brock was like, oh, this is the worst rumble ever. You don't understand that they were actually, for once, the WWE was trying to build a story. And I said, the guy who comes in, there's somebody coming who's going to take him out. I don't know who it is, but somebody's coming in. They're taking him out because he had 13 em- eliminations in a row. They don't do something like that. They wouldn't have run him through the whole entire roster. They might have. He may have gotten eliminated in the last couple minutes, but that rumble is one of the best booked and store and like thought out. Like they actually took thinking for that. I have seen rumbles since I started watching again, 10 years ago that have been terrible. And that was just a well thought out, well played. Okay. We wanted drew to be the chosen one, like, you know, 10 years ago or whenever he debuted and now he's back and he's proven himself and he's gone face in the last couple of weeks. And He's been killing it, and he has personality out the ass. So it was a great decision by WWE, and, you know, we always beat up on him, but I'm praising him for this decision. Yeah, I think I think they really got a lot of the decision-making right, which is something that we kind of almost take for granted that they're not going to do and just assume off the bat that they're going to make the wrong decisions. And, you know, like you said, with Roman, you know, it very easily could have had the entire uh, universe uh, up against him again. But instead, they chose to go the right route and kind of play more towards building a new star, which is always what the Rumble should be about in the first place. And so kind of accepting that as a reality and going through and, and doing that with Drew was just so smart. And I, I think that there's also a potential set up there, too, uh, with Edge returning as well. I could very easily see some sort of program with him and him and Roman, you know, because of the fact that they have uh, both the same finisher, essentially, with the spear. So I could very easily see some sort of tie in with that and having them come up against each other, possibly down the line. I know it seems like now they're building towards Edge versus Randy Orton. But if he's to stick around, that's definitely something where we could see Roman kind of finally take that heel turn jump so I think just across the board they kind of made all the right moves and the fact that they're sticking with Charlotte as a heel now made a lot of sense in the women's rumble even as controversial as that is so I think a lot of the the booking was done right which is something we don't normally expect nowadays and what was brilliant about it was that even like the little small details that they booked were amazing like I just thought the way that Brock got eliminated was so smart because it also protected Brock. Like, you needed Ricochet to kick him between the pads for Drew to get him out. And while it is impressive on Drew to eliminate him with a Claymore kick, it still protects Brock. And then they follow it up on Raw, that Brock comes out and F5s him. Like, we can't be led to believe that all of a sudden Drew is Brock's kryptonite. Like, they strung that well out properly. Like, even though Charlotte won that Royal Rumble, you know, they built up a lot of people to make them look strong in that match. I love that Alexa Bliss had a nice run. Shayna Baszler, you know, I thought that she was going to win up until the very end. Beth Phoenix looked really good. And hopefully maybe that sets up something towards WrestleMania. And then in the men's, you know, they planted the seed for Edge and Randy Orton that they followed up the next night. I liked how they in, like integrated the brawl on the outside, like with Samoa Joe and Aleister Black, and Kevin Owens pushing back on the disciples of Seth Rollins even after they were eliminated. And I also like that they didn't waste time letting you know guys who we didn't really think ever had a ch- chance to be in the Rumble last long for no reason. You know, a lot of guys like Elias. And, you know, guys from the New Day and um, Eric Rowan, they went out quickly and early in the match. They kept a lot of the main guys to the very end, and it was believable. It was just fantastic booking from the big stuff of the winners just to the small little details that they really hit out of the park on every single level. They did. 
the, I mean, I can't believe I'm, I'm praising WWE this this much because I've spent so many months critiquing about how they've booked things, and it all just came full circle this past Sunday with, I mean, again, was it perfect? No, it's not. But it's as perfect as you could probably realistically expect a plan to be executed with the Royal Rumble match. And the perfect person won. Um, and, and and my God, the ima- imagine the reaction if Roman Reigns had walked out of there. I mean, I guess from the reports I'm reading, Roman Reigns was indeed actually scheduled to win the Rumble, um, but it was changed somewhat last minute, as Vince McMahon is famous for doing. And you have Drew McIntyre, uh, who ends up getting to the arena, I guess, that day and confirming that, yeah, you're going over. And uh, like you said, Anthony, good way to protect Brock. Yeah, he got low blow, but it's kind of tit for tat. He low blowed Ricochet the uh, Monday night before, and then he gets a receipt at the Rumble, and then gets Claymore kicked, and uh, so that immediately put uh, an established Drew McIntyre as the babyface, the huge babyface, the kind of the underdog in a way, even though as you said, physically statured, he's not, but positioning wise over the last year, he has kind of been the underdog where you just don't ever believe he's going to win the big one, and he finally wins the big one. And his, his uh, speech on Raw was uh, heartfelt. I like how he didn't just flip to babyface. He's just kind of evolved into a babyface. It's kind of weird that he hasn't had a real turn. It's just kind of evolved into one, which I, I like that, that it's just evolved slowly into this babyface character. It's just very subtly into it. And he didn't turn and pander to the crowd and say, oh, we did it and we did it. And all this crap that Seth Rollins just immediately flipped to doing, which I think hurt him. Uh, Drew is a legitimate badass. He is a guy that has credentials that you believe he could beat Brock Lesnar, as you said, Mary. All of these all these things add up. And plus, he's had a run in WWE before. We all know he was the, quote, chosen one. And now he's truly earning that title with being the chosen one by winning the Royal Rumble. So... Um, do you guys have any final thoughts just just on the Rumble match itself uh, before we move on to the actual other uh, matches on the card? Um, I mean, I was going to say, like, the whole thing overall, like, they they started the Rumble with having Stone Cold do the entrance and do the opening. It just made it feel more important. It is amazing how Stone Cold Steve Austin can make something feel important even when he's not involved in the match. I mean, he's the only three-time winner of a Rumble. So even going into it when it started, you were like, okay, this is going to be important. Because I don't think that Stone Cold would sign off on something like that if he didn't know it was going to be a big deal. So, yeah, absolutely with that. And as far as Drew goes, yeah, he didn't really have um, a turn, I guess you could say. But he was paired with the lackeys. He was paired with Dolph Ziggler and all those guys. And, like, they removed him from that group. And then he was off TV. So that's a smart thing. Instead of having, like, you know, like a big show turn or a Randy Orton turn, like when they just turn right away, like Seth Rollins, they re- they did the smart thing. They, they removed him from the group somehow. And it was just, you know, he vanished from TV for a little bit. And then when he came back, he was kind of like his own person, like he was on his own. So they didn't really need a reason to say, oh, well, now he's a face. It was smart the way that they're building him. And I don't know where this came from, because usually they drop the ball on stuff like this all the time. And they will just have somebody just turn face or for some stupid reason. But them just like removing him from TV and then bringing him back and him kind of just being, you didn't know if he was a, a good guy or a bad guy. He was just being himself. And I think that's the character that we're seeing right now is that he is a, you know, he's kind of a tweener. I guess you could say that, but it's clear that he's going to be the face going forward. And they do, they need a face for raw. I mean, Seth Rollins tried to do it and it wasn't working. Seth Rollins is a pure heel. You want to hate him. He's a rat. He's a snake. And he does all these, he works better in that kind of character. So they're trying to find somebody to be that top baby face on Raw. And like, you know, Roman's on SmackDown and you could say AJ Styles, but AJ Styles also works better since his WWE run has gone. I mean, he was an incredible baby face, but, you know, he's a better heel. And I love what they're doing with AJ right now. So those are just like my little tidbits about the Rumble. I, again, the men's Rumble really, really, it, 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 I was ecstatic when Drew won. I was really ecstatic when Edge came out. 
But when Drew was like, I was pacing my living room. My friend was over. I was pacing my living room. And he and he doesn't watch wrestling. He just came over because everybody watches the Rumble, even if you're a casual WWE fan or not. And it's always fun. And I was pacing. And he's looking at me. And I was like, they better not let Roman win. They be- like, it's the stupidest decision they could do right now. Like, they did a lot of damage to Roman. He should have won in 2014 when he was going up against Batista. He had the crowd behind him, and then all the Daniel Bryan stuff happened, and then they had him win in 2015. And it just, you know, all of them trying to make him the top baby face went out the window. So I'm happy that they protected him, and they made a new star who has been, you know, like you said, credentials. He left. He came back. He beefed up. You know, he had that horrible stint with 3 and B, even though I th- thought it was funny. He's credible now, and they did a lot of smart things in this Rumble. It it was a fantastic Rumble. I have no complaints about it. You there, Zach? Yep, I I definitely think, sorry about that, (laughs) I definitely think that, you know, this Rumble had a lot going for it. You know, I think that... Overall, they just made so many uh, surprise appearances, and but none of them kind of were drowned out by Edge. And I think another thing that a lot of people haven't touched on is the fact that, you know, you had Beth Phoenix and Edge returning at the same Royal Rumble, which I thought was a brilliant little move as well. It kind of have almost teased that it was going to happen without you even realizing it when it happened. So uh, like you said earlier, Anthony, you know, just so many uh, small details that went into getting all the big details right. And it just felt like a, a master plan executed to a T. And although some of the little decisions along the way could have been uh, critiqued here and there, it's like you're you're kind of picking apart something just for the sake of picking it apart at that point. It, it's just so much of it was so great. I think that it was just across the board, a great team effort from top to bottom. Yeah, uh, there's nothing really I can add to it. Fantastic rumble, good lead-up matches, planted a lot of seeds, liked what they did with the Fiend and Daniel Bryan, just (laughs) thumbs up across the board for WWE. Nothing really much more I can add. Hey guys, so retirement may or may not be something that you're really thinking about, but even if you are years and years away, I mean, I'm 20 years away from retirement, but... It's something that we should all be thinking about. There's a company that has retirement plans that you can invest in precious metals like gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. There's also a big opportunity to grow retirement and grow income for either your personal or um, or a business. And anyone who signs up at this website receives a free investment kit and gift. So what is this website? It's brightmoneyinvestments.com. That's brightmoneyinvestments.com. You can diversify and grow with metals and cryptos, and you can even talk to someone there to get a better idea of what you should be investing in. So head on over to brightmoneyinvestments.com. All right, great. Well, um, I know we touched a little bit on the Women's Royal Rumble, uh, which I I didn't think was as good as the men's, but had the men's not been so good, I think we, our view of the women's Royal Rumble would be a little bit higher. But, um, you know, having Charlotte win, it wasn't the most exciting thing in the world. Um, I think that having her win makes sense, but I, not to spoil things for people, and maybe I won't, but I will allude to the fact that how she said on Raw that, she was going to make her announcement of who she was going to face at WrestleMania, what championship she was going after. And her clue was, I'm going after a championship. Now, uh, for those that don't want to hear a spoiler, I will uh, give you the fair warning now. So just skip ahead from this moment. But um, what I'm hearing is that Charlotte's actually going to be challenging Rhea Ripley for the NXT championship at WrestleMania. So if that is indeed the case, and again, rumors are rumors, but this seems to make sense that she alluded to a championship and having her versus Becky Lynch isn't exactly the most exciting match in the world. We've seen it time and again. They have great chemistry, but, you know, my God, enough. Uh, Bailey, again, her and Bailey, there's a little bit more there that you could work with because they haven't had so many matches together as her and Becky, but... It's not WrestleMania worthy. So having Charlotte go to NXT, again, if this is the case, to face Rhea Ripley for the NXT Women's Championship makes total sense to me, not only from the perspective of, hey, this is going to be a hell of a match, and we've never seen this before on a main stage, and the fact that, B, you also have 
NXT itself being elevated by Charlotte going to this brand and it's not being viewed anymore as the redheaded stepchild of the of the trio of brands. It's it's legitimately been its own third brand. Uh, it, it it certainly has done that, especially after Survivor Series. They've established it as its own third brand, a true third brand. And having Charlotte do that, if it's the case to me, I am all for that uh, that matchup if it indeed takes place. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm I'm the chick here, so I'm gonna talk about the women's rumble. Uh, I think the the women's rumble was just as good as the men's. The only thing there there were slight things that took away from it. First off, where was Sasha? I still want to know what happened to Sasha Banks. There were a couple guys who were in the who were supposed to be in the men's rumble that didn't show up. Rusev, um, I can't remember who the other Bobby Lashley, they weren't there, but besides the point, we already talked about the men. Sasha Banks not being in the rumble, something must have happened because I'm I hate Santino Morello and him coming out took all the steam out of oh, out of it for me. Yes. I was enjoying that rumble full force, even if Charlotte would have won. It just put a bad taste in my mouth because you're like, really? That could like Kelly Kelly came out and I was like, oh, but like at least I could deal with it, you know, because they didn't have a lot of returns. I love the fact that there were so many NXT chicks in there and they gave them their their light and their shine and stuff like that. And I was waiting for Baszler. I was waiting for Shayna. But, you know, Kelly Kelly comes out and I groaned audibly because she is the old guard. She is the diva. She is the Bella twins. All the people that like kind of, you know, bleh. and then you got Santina Mar- like really like just for that spot with Beth and Natalia. They didn't need that because you know what? Going back to Beth, Beth is the MVP of that whole pay-per-view. She split her head open and she was there to the very, very end. And she looked like a badass doing it. She was covered in blood. Her hair looked like spaghetti with like red sauce on it. She was impressive. It wasn't even like an old timer, like trying to keep up with the new people. She was like, no, I'm, I can still go like, let's go. And then he came out and I was just like, I, I, the only thing I could think of is that Sasha got injured. She didn't get cleared. Something happened and they stuck him in because he was there and they were like, well, we don't have anybody else. There wasn't anybody else, even though they probably could have put somebody else in there from NXT. But it was just such a huge disappointment. It goes back to, like, when Carmella won the ladder match and had what's-his-face help her. It's just, like, why is he in there? And, and, and he's out of shape, and, and he's the most, one of the most annoying WWE characters that has ever walked the planet. Um, so that was, that was disappointing. But the match itself, they, the girls were going. Bianca B- Belair, like, holy crap, dude. Like, she was made that night. She was so good in the Rumble. But going to the finish, I understand what you guys are saying about Charlotte. But to the point of if if, the, if she isn't going out after Rhea Ripley, who wants to see Becky versus Charlotte again? Char- Becky just won that match against Asuka. She is now walking around saying she's the GOAT. She's beat Charlotte. She th- There's nothing there. And Charlotte is a legacy. She is a Randy Orton. She doesn't need another opportunity or a rumble win. She's always going to be okay. She's always going to be in the main event scene. She is probably one of the best of all time, if not the best of all time. Okay, she beat Trish. She's proven everything. You have Shayna Baszler who walks in there at 30. Okay, at 30. And they built her up as a beast. She is the Brock Lesnar equivalent. She's more badass than Ronda Rousey. If Rousey wasn't coming out, I thought Baszler was winning, especially after the showing that they did in the fall with NXT dominating everybody. Like, there was no reason for Baszler not to win, and that's how she debuts on the main roster. Like, I'm here. Let's go. We saw all the mistakes they made with Asuka. They're trying to redeem it right now. But, you know, Asuka won the Rumble, and Asuka should have won the championship, and then Rousey should have dethroned her. That's how I feel personally about it. I understand what you're saying. Like, it makes sense about Charlotte, but it also made 100% total sense for Shayna to win, just like they just made Drew. You could have had – you have a storyline with Shayna. It's not like people who watch the main roster don't know who she is. She did that whole stint after – you know, Survivor Series in the fall where NXT was dominating and killing everybody on the main roster. And you just look at her and you know she's a threat. 
So I was really upset with the outcome, but it didn't take away from the fact that I thought it was a solid women's rumble. I think it was the best out of the three that they've had so far. Yeah, that that was my instant reaction too. Like you said, was that it was the best of the the three women's Royal Rumbles that they've had so far. And although I I wasn't one hundred percent behind the Charlotte as an initial reaction as the winner, I, I've come to kind of accept it a little bit more and understand that they're kind of going against the grain and just leaning into the hate from the internet for her uh, and having another opportunity and being given something else. So I can see what they're, what they're angling for, but especially to Matt's point, you know, if they are going to try and do Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair, then symbolically it would have made so much more sense in my mind, have Shayna eliminate Charlotte, have that really bother her that somebody from the lower quote unquote brand of NXT beat her. You know, she's supposed to be royalty having somebody come in and, and just, dispense her out like a piece of trash could have bothered her and it would have made sense to kind of build to this program of of doing the NXT championship without needing to have her win the rumble so I think that if that's the direction they're going although I think it'll be a great match they definitely could have built it a little bit better and you know touching back on the other aspects of the women's rumble I definitely agree the the Santino spot was so out of place it's so far gone you know we talk about having retro uh, feels from this event that was all the wrong Wrong types of retro feel where it just went back and uh, to the days of where Kelly Kelly was doing the stripper uh, thing on ECW when that brand was still around and you know having Santino come out in in uh, drag you know it just it felt so out of place amongst a very kind of badass women's Royal Rumble where it really felt uh, at equal weight to the regular Rumble uh, to the men's Rumble and it's just it was so out of place and just felt like kind of a slap in the face to all the progress that was made in that match and how of a, much of a big fight feel it felt like up until that moment. So it did really suck the air out of the balloon. And I think that it didn't help matters that, you know, nobody was really behind the idea of Charlotte winning the Rumble, which I think is partly the point. But it just it, having that so close together was a little bit of a miss. But overall, I think the Women's Rumble was still a fantastic one and still the best that they've done thus far yeah the the santina morella thing it just like like you guys both pointed out it just didn't really make sense it didn't fit and it's too bad because you know up here in canada santino morella the actual guy like he works for a, a sports channel and he does this show called aftermath and he's actually quite insightful and it was just too bad they came back to do a little I guess, cameo like that. But all in all, I think the why I'm not too upset with Charlotte is because she was the safe choice. And they really didn't put a lot of build into this Women's Royal Rumble. I think there was only seven or eight confirmed going in. And I, I understand why, because there was just so much put out, so much effort put into the men's. But, you know, leading up to this, I really didn't know who was the proper choice to win the Rumble, unlike in years past. So going in with Charlotte, who's been in kind of a holding pattern for the last couple of months, save for that brief feud with Asuka and uh, Kyrie Sane when she teamed up with Becky Lynch. But, you know, if they are going in a direction where she's going to challenge for the NXT Championship, I think that'd be pretty cool. I think that there wasn't a correct answer for this win because there just was no apparent favorite. Like, I thought maybe Alexa Bliss could benefit from it. But I think at the end of the day, Charlotte's someone who is the bona fide top dog, or at least one of them, in the women, women's division. And even though it may have not have been a sexy choice, it probably was a, the right choice when you considered where WWE was in a booking perspective. Definitely, yeah. So, boy, to pile on with uh, this this um, Santina Morella thing, maybe that's why I felt that it didn't live up to the men's end of it. Um, it's simply because of the Santina spot that, uh, again, like what the hell is WWE doing in this day and age when they're trying to make – uh, this, this women's division as legitimate as they can and give them as much opportunity as the men do and all this stuff. And then you have, the like um, like you were saying, Mary, with James Ellsworth and Carmella, that whole thing that lasted 
uh, my God, it felt like a year, maybe two. I don't even know. It was, um, and then you have Santina Morella come out in a spot that felt very 2008. It felt very um, nostalgic, and as you said, Zach, and I don't know if it's Zach or Anthony, in a way that uh, was all the wrong way. I don't need to feel this way to bring up these feelings of, uh, number one, it's not even funny, right? It's not like I didn't laugh. I mean, I said I, I actually I said I just said, oh, my God, I just kind of rolled my eyes. It's not the time nor the place to do that. Uh, and it just it was not a good feel to have a, a man dress up as a woman. I know Nia Jax came in the Royal Rumble last year and you all know how I feel about that. But uh, to have Santina Morella dress up as a woman and then come back out and steal a spot from a woman who could have legitimately had that spot um, like Sasha Banks, although we don't even know what is the deal with her. We don't know why she didn't participate. I've been trying to scour the websites, and I don't know why she wasn't there. Um, but for, for that reason, it just it put a damper and brought the thing down. And um, yes, B- Bianca Belair had a career night. I loved what they did with Bianca Belair, really establishing her as a, uh, as a main event, potentially down the line, main event uh, woman, in the women's division. And then, yeah, of course, you had Shayna Baszler, and she was my pick, along with many others. But you can still get to Shayna Baszler, Becky. You can still get to uh, Bailey versus, honestly, I don't even know who at the, at this point. The SmackDown side of the women is a little bit weak. So I, I don't know where they're even going with the SmackDown side of it. Maybe Bailey won't even be champion by the time we get to WrestleMania. Um, but the point is, the, the women who needed to have a good night had a good night. Shayna Baszler, yeah, she didn't win, but she made it to the end. She got eliminated, but you know sooner than later she is coming back to Monday Night Raw to confront Becky Lynch, which is, I think, where they're going to go with this. Um, and so I guess to, to kind of put a bow on the Women's Royal Rumble, let me ask you guys this question as, as a group. And do you think that they are... St- hinting at turning turning Becky Lynch heel. The reason I'm saying that, Becky Lynch came out on this past week on, on Raw in an interview with Charlie Caruso backstage. She said that, uh, you know, she was doubting herself. And then she said, I don't know why, because I'm the best. And she wears, like you said, she has a, a jacket that says the goat, right? We all know what goat is. And it just, she's getting a little bit arrogant now. And to me, that I mean, she cut basically a heel promo that she's the best. No one can beat her. She's done everything there is to do. She, who the hell, as a babyface, gets a goat jacket? It just, it didn't rub me the right way as a babyface. So is this just Becky being Becky, and we're all supposed to love her because we all know she's the goat, or is this a sign from WWE of seeds being planted for a possible heel turn down the line? It's <laughs> a good question. I, I don't know. I, I've now that you said it like that, I do think that maybe that's the direction that they're going, or she's gonna, you know, continue being this baby face who thinks she's the best, and Shayna is gonna come out and confront her. Um, but I just feel like her, Shayna getting eliminated kind of like was like, oh, she got eliminated, and and she's not that good. Um, I feel like it's shades of what they did to Asuka. Like, you know, Asuka had a two-year streak of being undefeated, and they just pulled the rug out from under her. And, you know, Shayna's the two-time champ in NXT. Um, She's legit like Brock and, and, and Rousey, where she has an MMA background. And she's just, you know, she's amazing. She's amazing. She's probably my favorite villain that I've seen in a long time. I, I draw to her. I like when she beats up people. So I I hope that's the angle that they're going in. I don't know what they're doing. Like, every, like everybody said, I didn't really have a pick in the women's rumble, but I definitely didn't think that it was going to be Charlotte because, as you said, she's been in a holding pattern. When I was starting to look at everything, and, and me and Matt have discussed over the, the last couple of weeks about, you know, sh- uh, Sasha and Bailey being in this tag team and like the role should be reversed that Sasha should have the title and Bailey should be the sidekick because as good as Bailey is in the ring or whatever, she's not, she doesn't have the personality, even though like they've changed it. And I'm super happy that she's not what she was. She just doesn't have that, that torch to carry, you know, she is the sidekick and I thought that Sasha was going to win 
the rumble and then turn around and, and challenge Bailey for it. Cause that made sense for me. And it wasn't going to be like, Oh, you're betraying me or I screwed you. If, if Sasha won and beat Bailey for the title that they would, it would be in a mutual agreement. At least one of them still had the title and they were going to move forward like that. And it was an easy way to get the title off of Bailey to transfer it to Sasha because Sasha has been the focus in that, that tag team or that duo that they're doing. So when Charlotte won, I was just like, what are you doing? And I was still questioning where Sasha was and everybody, you know, Sasha was saying she was going to, I did, she did announce that she was going to be in the rumble. Right. I'm not like misquoting and stuff. I don't recall her specifically saying she was going to be in the rumble. Does anybody else? Anthony, Zach. Yeah, you know, I I do remember, I thought that she was announced as being one of the entrants. I don't know if she specifically said it, but I do remember something coming out as Sasha Banks was one of the entrants. I don't know where it was that I read it, but I think that it was definitely a report that came from WWE at some point that had Sasha in there. Um, Yeah, because I totally thought that she cut a promo and she was saying that she was going to win or something like that. I could be making things up. There's so much wrestling. I get confused. My days bleed into each other. But yeah, so that's that's where I stand on the whole entire thing. I don't know what's going to go forward. I really hope that if Sasha, I mean, I'm sorry, if Charlotte won, that they are going forward with Rhea Ripley, because like other than Shayna, Rhea is the biggest badass in NXT. Like she's a beast and she's proven herself. And I, I, I hope that, I, you know, it's probably going to go in, in the direction though, that Charlotte might win the NXT title, which I would think would be weird, but it would make more sense for Rhea to beat Charlotte and still establish herself as a top dog in NXT in the women's division. So I don't, I, Again, like somebody said before, there wasn't a lot of buildup for the Women's Rumble. So you kind of went in there not knowing who was the favorite and stuff. And just like, again, the reason why the Charlotte thing rubs me wrong, it's because like, it's almost like the Roman Reigns syndrome. Like they give her every opportunity. I mean, she broke Trish Stratus's record already and Trish busted her ass for that record over years. Like how, how long has Charlotte been active? Five, six years? Like she really hasn't been around that long and she's already like a 10 time champ. So it was just baffling to me that they would hand her another opportunity but they did the same thing with roman but roman was a different like kind of beast he wasn't a i mean he is a legacy he is from the family he's from the family of samoas but that was never the angle with him they never like kind of made that like a a, a talking point when they were talking about they would mention it but it was just more that he's roman reigns you know and he's got a superman punch charlotte they have you know, showed down her throat that it is Ric Flair's daughter and Ric Flair is considered one of the best of all time, if not the greatest of all time. So it just left a bad taste in my mouth, but I hope that I'm proved wrong. Like you guys are saying, it's a smart decision and moving forward, you know, hopefully it goes after Rhea Ripley because I don't want to see Becky and Charlotte again, like that, that story, unless they're together as a heel duo and the four horse woman storyline actually comes to fruition. I don't want to see it anymore. Yeah, and if they are kind of going the direction of making, you know, Becky a heel, I guess that it kind of it can play into that a bit. As you said, if they do make a duo or, or you know, reunite the four horsewomen as a heel stable even, I, I could see that being very successful. And then it would tie in a lot of sense as to why the women of NXT would kind of take notice and want to get involved for WrestleMania. So there's some directions they can go with this. Uh, but I think when it comes to is is Becky going to be a heel, it's a it's a bit of a tough question because I think ultimately they're kind of basing a lot of her character around Stone Cold in a lot of ways where it's meant to be this tweener, and, and, you know, where he could 
Uh, you know, he was always the one who could do anything at any moment. You know, he could hit a stunner on anybody and just say, you know, it's because he's stone cold. And I think that's kind of the direction they're trying to move towards with Becky, where they're just making her such a badass that she's kind of above being a face or heel, that she's just kind of a, a character and she's meant to be organic and that you don't really know what the rules are with her. So I, I think that it's more them leaning into that concept than it is a direct heel turn. So I think that it's more of a an acceptance of her as a tweener as opposed to a a kind of uh, specific heel turn but i think that it, it plays into a lot of different programs to go that direction so i think it's a smart move even if they do decide to go full on heel with her yeah i think zach hit it right on the head there because you know we've seen this act before with becky you know over the summer she had a lot of heelish tendencies, specifically in a program with, I believe it was Lacey Evans, where she had a lot of, you know, cocky, arrogant promos that she cut. And unfortunately, at least for me, from my perspective, I did not like that side of Becky. It kind of got me annoyed, but they kind of pulled back from that over the last two or three months, and I got back on board with Becky. I hope that they're not going down that road again, that she's always going to be very, you know, arrogant, and she could do no wrong, and kind of like an anti-hero, like Zach said, building her like Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like, Stone Cold Steve Austin was the only guy who could stun Linda McMahon and still be viewed as a baby face. It feels like that's what they're desperately trying to do with Becky right now. I just personally hope that's not the case, because I found she came off very, very obnoxious when she did go down that road and almost made her come off as unlikable to a certain extent. Now, I also do have to understand that the reason she did turn babyface was from uh, an organized heel turn, and that's what got everyone behind her. So I kind of understand that they're trying to play off of that, but I don't know. I didn't really like the full-blown heck, uh, Becky, you know, heelish and arrogant persona she had in the summer. So I hope they're not going down that road again. I hope not. I don't, th I, you know, because like you said, it, there is a fine line between uh, charming arrogance and someone punch her in the face arrogance. And Becky, she started to flirt with that fence on Raw. And I, I just, maybe it is time to kind of turn her. And you know what? If Shayna Baszler is going to be facing her at WrestleMania, I could see the the audience at that at that time going, "Okay, Becky, you've had your run. Uh, you know, we're ready for Shayna Baszler to quote come up to the main roster, even though it's a true third brand now. Um, but we're ready for her to be on a bigger stage of the Monday Night Raw audience. We're ready for her to be the badass." We've seen her in a, um, AEW, <laughs> NXT. We've seen her in front of our eyes grow. We've seen her dominate. She's got a presence like no other. I could see the WrestleMania audience turning on Becky a little in favor of uh, in favor of Shayna Baszler. I mean, I, I could absolutely see that happening with the, the WrestleMania audience being very a very progressive audience in terms of who they want next, who they think is going to be their next, quote, um, organic star that i mean we've seen it with daniel bryan we're seeing it right now with drew mcintyre and we could see it with Shayna baszler i mean in time and again um the other thing too with the women's royal rumble and this this will be my my final uh comment on it which again i really i liked it i really did um was naomi's return and you know i tweeted this out because i saw her come down the ramp and i'm like who the hell is that like you look at her hair and you're like oh right uh, and she looks like if you guys have seen austin power she looks like foxy cleopatra where beyonce played uh, a part in that movie she is exactly like foxy cleopatra i don't know if anyone else made that um connection but uh it's, it's good to see her back i'm glad that she's back i hope that she's on the smackdown roster and i hope that god knows the smackdown needs help on the women's side um but overall yeah it was it was a good rumble i liked what they did and, and yeah they had molly holly or mighty molly as she came out it was a bit of you gotta always have nostalgia in the match and made total sense to me mighty molly coming down she lasted i don't know a few minutes right and she was what she was and um it was good to see her back too and but it was good also for naomi who i hope is a mainstay and it wasn't just kind of a one-off and then she goes back into obscurity but um, overall, yes, I, I, I hope that indeed Naomi stays. And I hope that, honestly, I don't know if I want to see Becky go hold on to that championship beyond WrestleMania. I, I mean, I think the fans are starting to feel it be like, okay, who who's next? Like, we want to know 
what that next who that next person will be that she hands the baton to and when Becky loses it's going to be a big deal and I can't see anybody more of a big deal than Shayna Baszler dethroning her at at WrestleMania uh, makes uh, to me it has to be no nobody else other than Shayna Baszler I I just don't see another uh, another possibility plus a uh, last thing when you look at their Survivor Series uh, one-on-one interview they did with each other that was I, I can't, that made me feel so much. They had instant chemistry with each other. They are cut from the same cloth. I loved their chemistry. I loved their their words for each other. They felt real, and I think that they'll follow up with this at WrestleMania. You there? Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I missed I missed my mute button. Sorry about that. No um, problem. Hitting on Naomi real quick. Yeah, it was awesome to see her back. I like the look she got going on. I mean, she's beautiful anyway. Um, but, like, that's that that was kind of overlooked by Beth Phoenix, uh, you know, performance in the in the match, which was unfortunate. And then the Santino Morella thing. Like, you forget about people like Naomi finally making her return. We didn't see a Nia Jax. You know, like I said, no Sh- Sasha. So that was kind of a big return. Um you know, and we didn't, I, I figured she was coming back in, in the rumble. So yeah, I hope that she gets right back into the main event picture. Um, she deserves to be there. She, she was being awesome and being Naomi and how she always is. Um, with the Sasha Becky thing, I, I totally agree, but Rousey's looming and she put out a tweet or an Instagram, I think right after the rumble and was like, you guys thought I was returning tonight, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, like, haha, not tonight, but I'm coming. And I think if it isn't Baszler, it's going to be Rousey. You're going to get Rousey versus Becky too. And hopefully there isn't a third party involved because there should have never been Charlotte, like shoehorn Charlotte. That's what my brother calls her. She should have never been in that match. Um, but you know, we got to get there. I don't know if Rousey's just going to show up like two weeks before mania. I mean, the rocks done it. Other people have done it. So it could be something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I can see the crowd getting behind Sa- uh, Shayna, you know, if it was Shayna, uh, Becky, because yeah, I think the, the Becky run is run its course, you know, and I don't necessarily, I hope though it doesn't turn into like a CM Punk thing because Shayna Baszler is a born heel. She cannot be a baby face. And that's the problem, you know, just because the crowd is cheering for Baszler, it's not necessarily because they want her to be the good guy. They just want the other person to get out, you know, so yeah, they want the dominant, you know, machine to take her out. It's just kind of the same thing with Brock. Brock's never really been a baby face. He's had those moments. But if you look back at it, it's because they didn't like the other person more. So they would rather the heel take him out. It's the same thing that happened with Punk and, and Cena. Everybody got behind Punk because they were sick of the John Cena stuff. They didn't want him to be a face. But the company took that as, oh, well, they're cheering for him. Let's turn him a face. And we all know that, like, Punk can do it, but he's not in his element if he isn't a heel. And it's the same, I feel the same way about Shayna. Could Becky be a good heel? Absolutely, 100%. And they need to evolve her character just like they did Seth. You know, you, you can't keep somebody in a holding pattern to the point where the fans start to, you know, not like them. And then you should change them right away. But, you know, the company... Right now we're praising him, but it's still WWE and there's still WWE logic. So we're going to see how we're going to have to see how this plays out. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that, you know, overall, the return of of Naomi was definitely kind of overshadowed by some other moments here. And I think that it was kind of a one of those accepted moments of where you kind of expected it to happen because she had been gone for, I believe it was personal reasons and and things like that. So it wasn't an injury or anything like that that was keeping her out. So it felt like a natural place. So I think that's kind of why it fell by the wayside a little bit. And I think it would have been smart, too, when the Usos returned to have her return alongside or, you know, the same night, kind of similar to the Beth Phoenix and Edge situation here. Uh, But, you know, that's just apples and oranges, I guess. You're kind of comparing things. Uh, But 
overall, I think that they're doing a lot of the things right for this women's division as long as they keep kind of trending along this way. And I, I think, like you said, Matt, I think it's time that we start taking the belts away from the four horsewomen and having them play into storylines, but maybe not necessarily be the champion anymore. You know, I think that's something that bogs down the women's division a lot of the time where it needs to have a belt involved for it to be a, a feud. And I think that's kind of a mistake and something that's holding back that division. And if they start to move the belts away from the four, four horse women and keep them as big names, I think that'll do a lot of good for the division going forward. Yeah, one person that I've been surprised that they pulled back on a lot is Alexa Bliss. You know, she came in first. I thought she had an impressive outing. But, you know, it wasn't too long ago that she was the face of the Raw division. And I think she was the first woman to be the Raw and SmackDown Women's Champion. It was her, Charlotte Flair. But it may have been her first. And, you know, to Zach's point, I just think it's kind of getting a bit redundant now with, like, Bailey, Charlotte, Becky, Rinse, Repeat. You know, when's the last time that someone other than them have been, you know, a, a women's champion in any capacity? And the answer is, you know, oh, oh, we're closing in on a year ago now. You know, I believe Alexa Bliss was champion in summer of 2018 before Rousey beat her, but it's getting a bit stale now. And I think that Bailey has suffered not so much through no fault of her own, because I feel for the most part that she has really, you know, excelled in this character, but she's had no dancing partners. And I feared that when they originally did this latest rendition of the brand split. And I thought that Alexa Bliss would be a good, you know, dance partner for her. And Lacey Evans has been an all right holding or temporary contender, but there hasn't been any legitimate contenders on the SmackDown side. Maybe Naomi fills that void, but I think that they have to start exploring options to be the face of the respective brands outside of the classic four horsewomen. And then just tie Sasha into it, it's kind of bizarre how she wasn't involved in any capacity. So, I mean, I feel like the women's division has gotten a little stale over the last few months, but it's not like too far gone that they can't get back on track leading into WrestleMania. No, they're, they're definitely not too far gone. And, I think there's room for improvement, but there's a lot coming down the line. I mean, um, the, R Ronda Rousey, as you alluded to, Mary, I did see that uh, Instagram or tweet or whatever the heck she put out there, uh, basically trolling the fans that thought she was going to return. But I read into it the same way you read into it, that it was like, hey, uh, yeah, you all thought it was going to return tonight, but... I'm not going to return when you think I'm going to look out. I mean, that that's kind of what I read into it. And, you know, maybe she's not going to return for WrestleMania. If I was going to put my money down, I would say probably. And the only logical person would be Becky. And then it leaves like, well, what would Shayna Baszler do? I mean, there's so many moving parts. And don't forget, there are two pay-per-views between now and WrestleMania. I mean, that's how Roman Reigns is going to get to The Fiend, right? That's how it's going to happen. That's how, presumably, Charlotte is going to get to Rhea Ripley. There, I mean, so don't forget, there are two big stops that we have to go through to get to Mania, and things can change in a big way. I mean, we had one-on-one -on -one Becky and Ronda, which, which turned into a triple threat after the uh, about a month. And, uh, you know, I was yelling about that, and I'm still yelling about how stupid of a decision that was but nonetheless they wanted to make sure charlotte can always say that she was in the first ever women's main event of wrestlemania which is uh, i think a big reason they did that but um so it's been an hour already and we've covered two matches so um let's i, I would i could talk about these two matches forever and just because of the different dynamics that happened here the returns of course um the the no shows as we mentioned and alluded to with uh, rusev and bobby lashley and sasha um among naya Jax and others, which I was very surprised about Nia Jax not returning. I had been calling for that for really weeks and weeks, and I, I've really got my ego bruised about that not happening. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, I'm okay with her not being in it. They clearly have other plans. Um, from what I'm reading, she's close to or is medically cleared already, so I'd assume that she comes back prior, prior to WrestleMania and inserts herself right back into the women's division. Um, but, all right, well, let's move on um, to, to another match that I think somebody mentioned earlier at the, um, at the beginning of the show, and that was The Fiend versus Daniel Bryan. Um, and 
uh, you know, I'll give my thoughts quick, and then I'll, I'll toss it to uh, to Mary, and we'll go around the the the, the uh, invisible table here. Is uh, I, I really thought this was the best match that the Fiend has had since he has been the Fiend. I like that there was no red light. Uh, I like the the the, the, uh, the physicality of the match, the pacing of the match. It didn't seem too long. The psychology. It wasn't it wasn't heavy on finisher, finisher, finisher. The fiend gets up, finisher, finisher. Like you know, we all know the beloved Hell in a Cell that happened a few months ago. It was a very well devised plan. It, it was the ending a little sloppy? Yeah, it was kind of clunky at the end where he just kind of stands up and then you know basically you know, gives him a mandible claw and you know and good night the lights uh, it was a little weird but other than that like i loved everything about this match that you i mean it's the best match you could have possibly thought of when you when you saw this on on paper the only thing that i'm surprised of i'm not disappointed i'm just surprised is that there was no clue into what the weakness of the fiend is my assumption and this is just my assumption and i, I alluded to this on a show uh, last week is that uh this could be the, the his source of power could be his mask and if you try to demask him or pull his mask off then and that is that will quote weaken him as you know I, I that's my guess uh, that's my guess as the mask is maybe his weakness or maybe they never follow up on that whatsoever as rambling rabbit uh, talked about a few weeks ago on Smackdown so anyway I like this match I think I'd give it a big thumbs up uh, was it a five-star match no no I, I mean I if I was gonna rank it I'd say like three three and a half out of five um, solid match and uh, I think it's time for The Fiend to move on, or, or maybe he still kind of hangs in Daniel Bryan's group until Roman Reigns is ready at uh, Elimination Chamber, which is when I think that he'll uh, the, the stars will align to finally make that uh, program official. Uh, yeah, it was a solid match. I don't have any real complaints about it. Um, I think I, I liked how it seemed like Daniel Bryan would, uh, first off, to go back to the weakness thing, everybody was saying it was the red light and they got rid of the red light. So obviously it's not that. Um, two, like there was a spot where Bray put on the manual claw on him and he tried to get him in an arm bar on the ropes, even though he had his hand in his, in his mouth. And that was the one moment in the match that stood out to me because it just showed Daniel Bryan's psychology, his quickness, how he thinks, how he's always countering everything. And that, like, even though he's the underdog in a lot of things, he is going to bite tooth and nail not to be the underdog. Um, it was kind of more of like a rebirth for Daniel Bryan showing why he's Daniel Bryan for me. It felt like it was the first match that Bray has had that hasn't felt like an all out squash, which um, a lot of the matches as him in the Fiend persona um, that's how it's come off. So it, it was a solid match. I, I, you know, I wanted Brian to win cause I just, I don't know where they're going with Daniel, uh, with Bray Wyatt. I, I just don't see storylines going forward as who's going to challenge him. You know, everybody's saying Roman Reigns, but I just have maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm not picking up on those things. So I thought that like Brian might get the title and it'd be like a transitional thing going into mania. Um, but there was a lot of history with Bray and, Brian at the Rumble uh, going back to 2014, which was I was watching before the actual Rumble on Sunday. Um, their feud started there. It was right after, you know, Daniel Bryan left the family and they had their match there. So, you know, maybe I was expecting a little more. No, but at the same time, it didn't disappoint me. I, I thought it was a solid match. It was good showing by both of them. You know, it showed Bray being a monster and it showed the quickness and, the, you know, the slyness and everything that makes Daniel Bryan one of the best wrestlers on the planet and why he, you know, shaved his head and went back to being the dragon. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of commentary on it because I, I didn't hate it, but it, it wasn't like, oh, my God, blah, 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 blah. it was a solid match. It was good. And I just don't know where they go from here. Yeah, I, I completely agree with a lot of your points there, Mary, where it's just like I I don't see where they're going with with the fiend right now. Uh there's not a clear path. I, I actually thought this was going to be a low light of the of the night just because I, I thought the strap match in general felt like a weird choice to to go with here. But I was proven wrong, and I should just know that whenever Daniel Bryan's in a wrestling match, it's going to be a good wrestling match. I feel like that should just be a mental rule going into any pay-per-view from now on for myself. But it, it just kind of it hit on all the right notes, but at the same time it wasn't uh, – 
completely spectacular. I think a lot of the way that The Fiend has been handled has kind of held back the match quality that he can have. They don't really know how to handle him, whether they should have him just squashing people or they should just have him have these kind of more grueling battles. And I think they're kind of lost in how to handle him. And I think really only Bray Wyatt kind of knows how this character should be handled. And I think that may be where some of the conflict comes in is because he's not making the choices of who his opponents are and things like that, uh, which you'll never have that kind of freedom in the WWE in modern era. But it's just one of those things where he does feel a little bit lost at this point. And uh, to your point too, Matt, about the weakness, I I definitely thought that they could have revealed something or alluded to something that would have made sense as to where they were going here. And I think that as a, a counter to the mask being his weakness, it could also be the hurt glove that he applies the mandible claw with. That's one thing that I've kind of had in my uh, mind cooking up a little bit here because he does kind of heavily uh, use that for symbolic purpose of what he's intending to do. So I, I wonder where they're going with this. And I know that there is some sort of plan, but I wish that it was just a little bit more uh, clear at this point so we could have something to start to sink our teeth into with Bray Wyatt. I think with Bray Wyatt, unfortunately, he's still feeling the effects from that god-awful Hell in a Cell match with Seth Rollins back in October, where they kind of booked themselves into a corner that he had to win the Universal title, or else he would have completely stripped all credibility from the Fiend character. And as a result, they put the belt on him, at least in my mind, way too soon. And he is clearly just in a holding pattern with um until roman reigns and him at least in my mind inevitably cr- uh, clash at wrestlemania as for daniel bryan and his and the fiends match at royal rumble i thought it was good considering what it was i still find that it took a back seat and has been taking a back seat to baron corbin and roman reigns uh on smackdown for the last two months or so and i feel like that kind of hurt the build to the match Like Zach said, there wasn't a whole lot of expectations for it. But in terms of the match itself, I thought it was good. You know, Daniel Bryan and Bray Wyatt have very good chemistry in the ring. I like both wrestlers. The ending could have been better. But all in all, I would give it a solid, you know, 7 out of 10 match. And the red lighting not being there definitely helped. So I guess what took it away from me, the excitement away from me heading into this match is that I knew and I felt that it was just, you know, a step along the way to Roman Reigns versus The Fiend, and there was never a real belief for me that Daniel Bryan ever had a real shot to win the belt. Yeah, I felt that way too. I felt that Daniel Bryan was going to put up a good fight, that he would get closer than he did the first time, Um, but in his loss we would find out at least a bit of a... Some, we would salvage the moment, if you will, by finding out something about The Fiend that is a little bit more progressive. You'd, you'd see something. You'd learn something. And it was just kind of business as usual. And, you know, I, I'm okay with that. I don't think it's getting stale just yet. But there needs to be something we learn a little bit more about The Fiend. And, and I'm fine with the, the, the slow burn. I love slow burn. And I maybe I'm just being conditioned to WWE's style of 100 miles an hour and no patience with fans and all that kind of stuff. But I'm all about the slow burn. And if we just take a little extra time to learn more about The Fiend step by step, so be it. Um, and I think that, again, they're not going to rush to Roman Reigns. I, and, and I know, Mary, you don't think that they're going to be going. You don't see signs of Roman Reigns. But that's, the, I think, the whole point is that they have been so separate for a while now that it I mean it begs to have these two the story begs to have these two go one on one because who else is the fiend going to challenge for a championship I mean look around the roster on Smackdown look around the field there's not a whole lot of guys that the fiend could presumably uh, go one on one with and make it believable uh, especially how the position is uh, the position of the fiend has been Im, like immortal or just kind of inhuman and there has been nobody on the roster of, on smackdown anyway that you would think oh man that would be awesome to have him face so and so it's really roman reigns like that is the obvious pick and especially around wrestlemania season so um all right guys well in the interest of time i'm gonna i'm gonna move on to to the next match here and um i'm actually gonna touch on sheamus and shorty g or as i like to call him uh, Chad Gable, uh, Sheamus and Chad Gable. I, you know what? I I thought that this match honestly was exactly what it was going to be. It was going to be a match in which 
Uh, Sheamus comes out on top, number one, which I think was the right decision based on where they see Sheamus going and that it's a stepping stone for Sheamus. Uh, so I think having Shorty G, having Chad Gable go in there and do what he does his entire career in WWE, put up a good fight, get the crowd invested, uh, you know, just put on a, a clinic in terms of actual wrestling ultimately to just come up short with a couple of hope spots that's been his gimmick that's what he does and it's not surprising he lost here i've kind of come to the reconciliation that wwe is not going to do anything major with chad gable so i'm just fine i'm fine with them at least using him in a role that is that is not quite to the to that top tier or even that mid top tier but as a guy that is a gatekeeper and can have a good match with anybody and he's a good hand and he can bring a, an audience in and make the guy he's working with look like a million bucks. I'm, you know, if that's the role he's been designated to, so be it. It's better than him being on like 205 Live or main event or just kind of in the abyss of nowhere. So if this is as far as he'll go, then I've accepted it. As far as Sheamus goes, I think that this, this program is over, and I think that Sheamus is moving on to bigger and better things. Who that may be, I don't know. Um, but overall, I think this match was exactly the way that we thought it was going to play out. Um, to be honest, I only caught like a little bit of this match, so I don't have that much uh, input about the technicality of the match. As far as characters go, you know Sheamus is going to end up back in the main event scene Um, I've been saying since he returned, though, it's kind of fallen flat. He went back to his old look, but he's still kind of in the character that he took on when he had the mohawk. I really don't know what they're doing with him. I don't think they know what to do with him. Um, Chad Gable, it's interesting that you're saying this because he is. He's a technical wrestler. He is in the veins of Kurt Angle and Shelton Benjamin, and he's one of those collegiate athletes. But he's also being built as the ultimate underdog. I mean, he's kind of in the same position with da- that Daniel Bryan was in. Daniel Bryan, though, had a lot more wins, and they, they didn't give him a crappy gimmick uh, with Shorty G, which is just insulting to Chad Gable in general. I mean, they did take Bryan and put him in the Wyatt family when they shouldn't have, and they had that whole thing going. But I, I wouldn't count him out uh, necessarily yet because – when an underdog starts making waves and, you know, like people get behind him, sometimes that spark happens and, and and the company does get behind them and they'll have faith with them. I just think they don't know what to do with his character and they're straying away from the typical Kurt Angle angle or the Shelton Benjamin angle that, you know, he was a collegiate athlete and he was a wrestler, you know, all that that stuff that those guys have done it because they don't want to do it again. And, like, that's kind of been, you know, put on those guys. Those are the guys who, who carry that torch or that, that gimmick. So I, I don't know what they're going to do with him, but I, I wouldn't count him out yet because he's got the underdog thing going for him. And I think at some point he might have a breakout moment where the crowd really gets behind them. But that all depends on if they put him on TV enough and people get familiar with him enough. And, you know, he has a one, two, three kid moment, you know, like not to like throw way back, but you, you never know. He has the talent. He he's good. I think he has a good look, even if he's a small dude. Um, and we've learned in the last 10 years, thank God that um, your size doesn't really matter. It matters about your heart and your talent. So those are those are my opinions about that whole match. Of course, Sheamus was going to win. He's a main eventer. He's been a main eventer. He's a Triple H guy. Um, but I don't know what either character, what holds for them in the future. I just hope that Chad, Sheamus will be safe. He'll be fine. I just hope Chad Gable doesn't, you know, fall to the realms of, a Drew McIntyre or Ginger Mahal where they have to go away and then come back and, and then prove themselves or it turns into an EC3 thing. Like he's in a very precocious position. I don't know if that was the right word. I use wrong words all the time, but I, I, I wouldn't count him out yet. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of glad you brought this one up, Matt, because 
I, I remember a few months back when I was first starting this podcasting thing, too, when we were talking about Chad Gable, when he was still Chad Gable, and I mentioned the rumors that they would move to possibly renaming him Shorty G, and we both kind of had a laugh about it and said, you know, that that seems like something WWE would do, but we don't think they're that stupid. And yet here we are, you know, months later talking about Shorty G getting his face kicked off by Sheamus on the pre-show. I mean, it all is kind of come to to full circle here but i think that as mary said you know he does have that ultimate underdog feeling i think where they're kind of messing up is that they're trying to make him a little too gimmicky with that i think him coming back in the uh, he reminded me of melvin the superhero from jeff dunham's act if you ever seen jeff dunham where it's just he's in this shiny blue and green It, it just was a horrible character move in my opinion with how they uh, renamed him Shorty G and tried to make it seem like he actually came up with that name, which was just obnoxiously laughable. Uh, it just made no sense to me. And I think that, you know, it was a little weird, too, having Sheamus, you know, make his in-ring reappearance on the pre-show. I know they're trying to kind of condition the idea that the pre-show is a part of the, the pay-per-view just as much as the main card, but it still has that feel of if John Morrison can get a re-debut on SmackDown, why is Sheamus stuck to the pre-show of the Royal Rumble and not even make an appearance on the card? If it's going to be a squash match, you know, open the card with it or something so that it doesn't feel like so much of an afterthought. And like to your point, Mary, they just don't seem to really have much of a direction for him. It's just kind of like they're like, oh, right, we're supposed to get Sheamus back out there. So let's shove him in the ring at the beginning of the Rumble and, and do it that way. Yeah, it just seems like kind of a pit stop for Sheamus for bigger and better, better things to, you know, ease him back in. It doesn't feel like Shorty G has a whole lot to gain from this particular feud. Uh, you know, I touched on it last time I was on the show that I think that Sheamus and Braun Strowman would be perfect dancing power partners for one another, pre- preferably with the Intercontinental Championship or something along those lines. You know, Shorty G, unfortunately, he really picked up steam during the King of the Ring tournament as Chad Gable, and then they just put their paws on it and really just derailed all of his momentum. I just feel like I, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, there's worse spots for Chad Gable to be, but unless he goes back into another tag team where he's had success in the past, whether it be with American Alpha or Bobby Roode or Shelton Benjamin, unless he's in a tag team, I really don't see... Shorty G or Chad Gable or whatever rendition of him you want to go with, I don't see him being relevant in any kind of title picture. I think he would only be on TV in such a role. Probably not. Um, and you know, it's more than likely that he just, again, he's just kind of the feel-good underdog that likes to make sure that everyone embraces who they are, and it's that feel-good PG message. Uh, and I, I just, I don't know. I, I have that feeling that they're just... This is nothing more than a, a, a stepping stone for Sheamus. I mean, I, I just don't believe that that after this, that Sheamus is going to not go anywhere after this victory. I think that Vince McMahon has always kind of had a liking for Sheamus. I think that's just kind of the way that it, it that it's been. And uh, for Chad Gable, I mentioned this on a show with Ashley that I did last week in our pre uh, preview show for the Rumble that the WWE has a habit of just taking guys who organically get over. And they don't have anything flashy. It's just kind of a straightforward, you know, uh, in-ring prowess type of I have a presence in the ring and I can tell an awesome story. And they're organically getting over and WWE says, oh, hold on a second. We're going to fix this. And then they throw some crappy gimmick on it that is that is over the top. And they think everything has to be cartoonish and flashy colors and all this stuff. And it completely just negates all the progress that that person has made organically getting over when they put the WWE spin on it. And I say that in quotes. Um, It's just, it seems like that every time they're like, we'll fix this. And it's like, no, no, that's the thing. You're, you're, it's not broken. Right. And that's what it feels like to me with the, with, uh, with Chad Gable, Chad effing Gable. I'm not going to say shorty G. I hate, I hate myself every time I say it. Um, so uh, moving on again, in the interest of time, um, I, I have to move on uh, to the next pre-show match of Andrade versus. Um, oh God, why am I losing it? Uh, I'm sorry, Andrade versus somebody. Pick me up here. Why am I losing it? Humberto Carrillo. Humberto, jeez, Humberto Carrillo. Who they also 
have written off on um, Andrade was written off on Monday Night Raw. We all know now due to a well 30 day suspension from the wellness policy. So that was interesting that he was written off this past week for a four week absence from Monday Night Raw for a wellness violation. Again, everyone here hears that and they go, "Oh, steroids!" Like that's what the outsiders of wrestling think. Probably it could be just a you know overuse of pain pills or you know muscle relaxers or something that shouldn't be in the systems. It's not always steroids. It's what everyone points to. Um, but nonetheless, he's gone for 30 days, but he still has the championship. And I think that's interesting to me. And, and I'll get to Rumble Match in just a second. But it's interesting to me on the, the wellness perspective. Typically, when somebody gets suspended, that they'll either drop the championship or embarrass them in some kind of way before that they go out. I mean, look what they did with uh, with Robert Roode, who got literally buried by Roman Reigns with the announce table a number of weeks ago on SmackDown before he was knocked for his uh, 30-day wellness violation. And, yes, he got his head DDT'd on the concrete by Umberto Carrillo. And uh, I love the way Zelina Vega sold it. She is so effing money. It's it's not even funny how awesome and how much she adds to his character. Um, but I'm glad they didn't take the title off him. They looked at the bigger picture and said, yeah, he's going to get dinged for this. Let's write him off. He'll come back in four weeks. This is his first violation. I'm glad that they didn't just say, hey, no, we're going to cut off our nose to spite our face. And we're going we're gonna to show you. It's the bigger picture here. Um, but the match at the Royal Rumble, I thought was really good. Um, th- these guys took some crazy bumps. Um, I, you know, Some of them made me cringe in a way that it's like, oh, my God. And I expected them to put the X sign up. They busted their ass. Um, Umberto Carrillo coming out on top makes total sense. I'm on board for it. I, it was really more about Umberto Carrillo getting a, a rub from the, the, the spotlight and getting – this is really his biggest match to date. It's a pre-show, but this is his biggest match in his career was the pre-show to the Royal Rumble. It was about just showing that he can hang. He can certainly hang. I like what I see with Umberto Carrillo. I also liked on Monday Night Raw the fire that he showed after Zelina Vega interfered, and he didn't just go, ah, oh, shucks, you know, and he just kind of walks up the ramp. He showed fire fire on Monday Night Raw by beating the hell out of out of Andrade and laying him out. I like that. That's what I want to see from a babyface. It doesn't always have to be say your vitamin or say your prayers, take your vitamins and kissing babies. This show he showed fire and I did not expect that and I like that. So um all right, well your turn guys. Um there's a couple moving parts <laughs> parts to this. I'm gonna be merry. Uh one what about the 30 day not defense? Like he's not going to defend his title for 30 days. Everybody forgets that, but they only use it when they want to use it, which whatever Two, he's not going to lose the title. Cause he's dating Charlotte Flair. <laughs> Three. Um, yeah. Wellness policy. If he's using steroids, they're terrible steroids. Um, it's gotta be something else. But as far as, um, <clears throat> Umberto and Andrade, Andrade is what they wanted Alberto Del Rio to be. um, even though Alberto Del Rio can speak better English than Andrade can, he is a Spanish superstar that they wanted to represent the Hispanic community, um, and they got it. You know, they've had so many hits and misses. I mean, Rey Mysterio's back, and but Rey Mysterio at this point is a Hall of Famer, and he, I, I saw an interesting conversation the other day asking, like, where would you rank him in the Hall of Fame? And people kind of, like, don't, or greatest of all time. They don't rank him in because he's a luchador and he's a smaller guy. I mean, the man's had a fantastic career and he's still firing on all cylinders with all the surgeries that he's had. So they've been trying to fill the Mysterio void for a long time and they thought it was Del Rio and Del Rio is a scumbag. And I will say that right off the bat, I hate him. He did nothing for me. His whole gimmick, even when he had the, the announcement, like he's just terrible. So they found an Andrade, so I just kind of feel like Andrade is an untouchable right now. He is the face of their Spanish people division, whatever you want to call it, of the WWE. Humberto, I don't know a lot about him. I didn't even know he existed until he started doing spots on um, the main roster. I guess he was in NXT originally. Um, and he's kind of like the equivalent to Sin Cara, who they thought Sin Cara was going to be it, and, and Mysterio. And you're right, he showed guts. Um, I just don't understand. I, I mean, I understand why they didn't strip the title of him or anything like that, because, like I said, they want him to be the face of the division. And he's doing a hell of a job, 
And Zelina, I mean, I've met Thea a whole bunch of times in real life. She's awesome, and she's a hard worker, and she's just got the thing, man. She's got the same thing that AJ Lee had. You know, she just has it um, when it comes to the mic and her personality and her presence and enhancing the male talent when there needs to be enhancing, and she can go, too. So it was a great match. I'm glad he beat him up and he didn't walk away with his tail in between his legs because they need that. They want that focus to get their demographics for, you know, that type of nationality and stuff like that. So and they're good guys. And it it, it once again proves just like Asuka has been proving the Vince McMahon. Oh, I can't understand you in, in promos doesn't mean crap. As long as they're putting on a show and they're telling their storytelling through, you know, their characters and their personality. It doesn't have to come down to language. So those are my feelings about it. I didn't, again, I was in and out during the pre-show, so I didn't really catch their match. I caught the stuff on Monday Night Raw, and I liked the way that they executed it. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely agree to your point, Mary, that it's it's aimed at the uh, Hispanic demographic, and they're definitely looking to try and fill the void that Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero have left behind. And I think that, in a way, this Andrade uh, suspension can be a blessing in disguise, because I think there was some teasing with the idea that Zelina could switch her loyalties over to Humberto when he was kind of uh, getting in the way of Andrade and proving himself a little bit. And I think that they have a fantastic chemistry. So if they do return Andrade, I could see it being in some sort of capacity where they set up a tag team match at WrestleMania, where you have Andrade and Humberto taking on Rey Mysterio and his son Dominic. I think there's a lot of different ways they can go with this. That would be my personal fantasy booking option. Uh, but I think that really Humberto and Andrade are kind of showing what it takes to be the ones to fill those shoes that, you know, Ray and Eddie have left behind to take that Spanish community and really involve them in the product. And I think that eventually they're, they should expand out and not just be, you know, oh, Spanish wrestler one versus Spanish wrestler two. But I think that will come with time. And I think that having that actual face off with Ray Mysterio and maybe his son, Dominic, having that kind of blow off with those three will definitely do a lot of good for that and then they can kind of move on and be a part of the regular picture. But I think that their chemistry has been fantastic, and every time you get those two in a ring, it ends up being a good match. So I think they're doing a lot of right things with what they did with this. Yeah, I'm personally not a fan of Humberto Carrillo. Like, I, um, this week kind of changed me a bit more in a positive direction, but I just really found him vanilla. And the matches are good, but I may be just a sucker for good storytelling. I felt like a lot of it played way too much on just the nationality part of just pushing the Latino narrative. And, like, that's great, and I like it. And I found that Rey Mysterio and um, Andrade had a lot of good matches. But I just I want something more to it than just nationalities colliding. You know, there has to be a bit more meat to the storyline to draw me in. As for Andrade and the wellness policy, I think it is a good move by WWE not stripping the belt off of him because they do clearly have big plans for him moving forward into the future. I actually read today that Paul Heyman really likes Andrade and plans to push him even further. So aside from the fact that the match itself I wasn't too intrigued with and wasn't overly excited for, they have planted seeds to go in a whole lot of different directions for exciting storylines down the road. They have, and I'm looking forward to what they have to bring to the table. And regardless of whatever reason that they're keeping Andrade the champion or pushing him, um, whether it's nationality or not, the fact is this guy can perform. This guy is is the real deal inside the ring, and we all agree Zelina Vega adds just so much to his character. And I think I can say in unison that I we are glad that you know while they teased Zelina Vega um, and her loyalty being swayed. I am, at least, anyway. I, I know I said the we collectively, but that's, they did not decide to, to split these two up. I think that they go together so well. And Zelina, what she adds to his character is is just so much personality. She adds that element that 
uh, it's that extra layer that he needs in order to get to that next level. He has somebody that can can help him cheat to win. He's a he's a heel. Selena, in her own right, has a hell of a presence. AJ Lee is a great comparison. She just has that it. She can cut a promo better than half the women on the roster. She has the presence. The way she speaks, it's believable. Um, yeah, she's she's really good to look at. But you don't you don't really think about that part of it, particularly because. And I, I also mentioned this uh, at some point last week that uh, this is a professional relationship between Andrade and Zelina. This is not any kind of romantic relationship or teasing romantic relationship. This has been 100% business the entire time that they've been together. And I love that. I love that dynamic that you're not even thinking that oh, these two are secretly dating, right? No, I mean, we all know it's tr- actually Charlotte. But in storyline world, you're not actually – you're thinking that. You're thinking that Zelina is truly interested in making sure that Andrade comes out on top. He does whatever he needs to win. And Selena Vega is 100% invested every single move in a match. I mean, the camera pans to her every 30 seconds because it's worth seeing. Because she is just such on the roller coaster of ups and downs with every move in the match. And Andrade, you know, when he gets knocked down, she looks concerned. When he's about to win, she's, you know, up in arms. I love her roller coaster of emotions. They're not overdone cartoonish. They're just perfect heel manager ish, if that's a thing. And I love everything about it. These two are, I love where they could go. Uh, I think United States Championship is a place that he could live for co- quite some time, but I certainly could see him in the WWE title picture, maybe even a year from now. Um, maybe sooner, but probably a year from now, I think he'll be fully ready and fully developed in, into uh, this WWE world to uh, challenge for the WWE Championship. So um, I, I hate to keep doing this, but uh, again, uh, Wait, Nate, can I just chime in yeah, real go quick? Um, going back, I think it was Zach who said it. Um, the business aspects, like with Zelina, like you know, it's not a romantic thing. I, I truly believe that she could start like a faction, you know, and be recruiting people. I don't know if she's going to betray Andrade because she has been so loyal to him. So she could turn into. I mean, she's got the chops, man. I mean, she's amazing. Like you're saying. She could be like the next Missy Hyatt. She could be the next, you know, Sunny. Who's to say that she doesn't start, you know, gathering these people to dominate the whole entire, you know, the roster at some point? That was just a quick thought while you were speaking. <laughs> I didn't think about that with her as a faction. Yeah, she could be a faction leader, no doubt. I mean, when's the last time we saw a women faction, like a legitimate, now I'm talking Riot Squad, that doesn't count, like a legitimate women's faction that you were... I don't know the last time that's been done. I'm talking legitimate. I'm not wow, even talking right? about a woman, though. I'm talking about a woman manager having guys, you know, like she could oh, do yeah, it. Like yeah, you're yeah. saying, like, like she adds so much to Andrade's character. She is Paul Heyman to Brock Lesnar, you know, like, cause there is, there is a language problem sometimes, but you know, it, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care about that stuff. I love Asuka screaming in Japanese at everybody. It makes me laugh. It shows that she's vicious. <laughs> It just, I think she's like part of the Yakuza when she does it. But I'm just saying, having a woman have, you know, her, 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 her guys, and she is Paul Heyman to Brock Lesnar to Andrade. It's, it's the same thing. She's a mouthpiece, and I really feel that she could do that if she wants to, instead of like going after all these Spanish guys, except the old guard like Mysterio and, and what have you you know, start getting all the Spanish guys together and, and have her clients help because she is the business manager. Just quick thought. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and to your point too, Mary, that that's kind of the thought process that I have behind the Umberto, you know, joining forces with Zelina. Cause you could see that kind of spark in her eyes of thinking of recruiting him. And I think exactly what you were saying, you know, having a stable would suit her so well because she is such a good mouthpiece. And, To your point, too, Anthony, I do feel that Umberto has been rather vanilla. He's kind of just kind of been the hang around the faces and, oh, yeah, I agree with that point. He doesn't really chime in or have any personality to him yet. He just kind of does what a face should do without any real rhyme or reason to where he's building to. So having him uh, have a heel turn and, and join Zelina and maybe attack Mysterio and Dominic or something like that instead of helping, I think that would be a brilliant way to evolve his character and to evolve Zelina's involvement in the roster and really lead to something uh, bigger and better for everybody involved. All right. Well, uh, 
if uh, if you guys are uh, satisfied on that point, which is a good point. I honestly, you know, like thinking about that, I never thought of Zelina as a stable leader, but that is a, uh, hey, Zelina, uh, there's more to Zelina than what's on the surface right now. I don't think we've seen her full potential yet. And if she, you know, I think it wouldn't do her, a, you know, it would do her a disservice if she remains for her career as just the manager to Andrade. I need, I want more from her, even if it's as the women's champion, right? I mean, even if she becomes a women's champion on SmackDown or Raw at some point, I, th- I could see that. She can go in the ring. She, I don't think that she is as, I guess, polished, if you will, as like Becky or Charlotte is the, t- you know, the, some of the top women, but she certainly, I'd love to see her as champion and then, and then maybe even have a stable of her own. But if she's going to be the mouthpiece for a stable of, of the, you know, Hispanic men or whatever, maybe they call them La Familia. It wasn't that like something Eddie Guerrero did was La Familia and that's ringing a bell with me. So yeah, they, she could definitely do something like that. There is so much unta- untapped potential there that if they don't dig into what she's truly capable of, they're missing the boat because there's so much sitting there. And Andrade's reaping the benefits right now. He's good in his own right, but without Zelina, it, he feels naked out there. There have been times when Zelina's been either injured or just not there, and he comes down to the ring and you're like, oh, like this doesn't feel right. Where's Zelina? And you don't normally feel that with a manager. Like, you know, I mean, not a great comparison, but when Leo Rush wasn't there with Bobby Lashley, it was like, meh, like, right? I mean, you don't care as much. But um, so anyway, um, uh, moving on, and I, I really want your guys' thoughts on this, too, is Roman Reigns and King Corbin with the Falls Count Anywhere match. My quick thoughts on this is, eh. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I, I said on Twitter that it was a hard-hitting match, that it, it was a very physical match. It was kind of what you expected, but I feel like it was just another SmackDown uh, match. Like, it, it didn't hold a whole lot of weight to it. There wasn't really much on the line. Um, and yeah, you had the predictable interferences with Dolph Ziggler, Robert Roode, and the Usos, so that was really no shocker there. Eventually, Roman gets the spear uh, for the victory, and you know, hopefully this program is over. I would think that it is. Um, this one didn't stand out to me as like, oh my god, you know, I put this in the top three, not even close. To me, this, and it wasn't a terrible match, it was just kind of like, eh, it felt like a SmackDown rerun. I got to disagree with you for once. Um, I felt it was an actual Falls Count Anywhere match. Like, they've they've held back so many times on these gimmick matches where they don't, you know, go full throttle. I liked how they used the arena. They were in a baseball stadium. So it wasn't like it was just backstage and somebody getting popcorn thrown at themselves. or you, You know, stupid stuff that they've done in the past. They they legitimately, you know, went through the arena. They were using, you know, the tarps. I made a Houston Astros joke during the, the pay-per-view. I was like, who's going to start banging on, on, on garbage cans? Uh, <laughs> topical humor. Um, you know, uh, I, I liked it. I thought it was good. I thought it was a good grudge match. Um, I don't know if this is the end of it. I hope it's the end of it because, like, I'm so wishy-washy with this Baron Corbin thing because he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. Like, I can't stand him. He's annoying. You know, the dog food thing was just grinding my gears. You know, and then, like, CM Punk came out and said that he liked it because it was, like, traditional fucking old... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to curse. Traditional old-school uh, wrestling. But, like, I don't know. I liked it. I thought the involved... I, I mean, we knew the Usos and we knew Dolph and um, Bobby Roode were getting involved. Um, but it, it, it added to it and it's adding to that stable that I've been pushing for months with the Usos and, and Reigns and despite them not being heels that they have the bloodline and them getting, you know, all the Samoan people together and you could throw Naomi in there too, if you wanted to another, you know, even though she's not Samoan, she's married into the family. Um, I love that aspect. I think that, him t- being with the Usos on a regular basis and the Usos are the Usos. They're a solid tag team. They're awesome. They have great spots granted, you know, outside of the, the, they've had some problems, but like whatever their favorites, their legacy, it really adds to Roman's redemption story. Like it takes away from the fact that he was sick and he came back and we're not using that as, Oh, that's why we like him now. 
he's like part of something that's bigger than him. And it's not the, just the focus of him because he can't just focus on him when the Usos are involved because what are they? Six time champs, seven time champs. Like, I don't know. They might be a tag team forever, but you know, maybe they couldn't do solo runs, but I feel like the three of them together, it's just, it feels better. It, it, it's, it, you're invested in it because you want to see like this family storyline and them having backs. And like, now that the shield is like completely, you know, obsolete because Dean Ambrose is gone and he, that was, that was Rain's brother, you know, Seth Rollins has always been shaky with everybody. Cause he was the traitor. He was the Judas, but I, I, I don't know. I loved the match. I thought it was good. I thought it was a good falls count anywhere match. I love like there was the one spot I don't remember where it was where they were out in the ring and they went through like some kind of table and I screamed like holy oh, yes like I was invested in the match and and Corbin has this like this just grating thing where you want to see him get beat even by Roman Reigns even if you don't like Roman Reigns Baron Corbin has been a good dance partner with him because you actually hate Baron Corbin more than you hate Roman Reigns despite whatever you think about Roman Reigns. Yeah, and I I agree with a lot of your points about about Roman and about the Usos, Mary. But I I do kind of tend to fall more on the side of Matt with this one as far as the match itself goes. And I don't think that it's anything about the match itself that was was particularly bad. I think it's just the feud itself was so poor and the build up was so poor, and it really did make a lot of sense as a, a grudge match and having it be the blow off, but it just didn't feel like there was any build to it. And I think maybe too, it also uh, it was a little bit of the syndrome of being on the Royal Rumble card. It felt so less lesser. And maybe if it was on a different pay-per-view, it would have felt like a bigger deal, but having this falls count anywhere match, which was done very well. And they did a lot of great spots and used the arena quite nicely. I just feel felt like the whole time that I didn't feel invested in it. And I think that's exactly, Exactly where the disconnect comes and I think where a lot of people are kind of ignoring the match quality which was very good because WWE kind of forced our hand and made us not like it because the build-up was so bad I'm completely agree with you too Mary about I understand that Baron Corbin is supposed to be a heel and I'm supposed to hate him but I, I just can't seem to get invested in him versus Roman Reigns anymore and I, I it's a lot to do with his character and I think they need to find a, a fresher way rather than just having him uh, kind of poke the bear with the bigger uh, fish in the sea and, and I think that it's just time that you know, they find a way to reinvent Baron Corbin. And I really hope and pray that this is the end of the feud and this is where it all ends. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't mind the match. It was okay. I was expected that um, Roman Reigns would go over. I lean more on the side with Matt as well here and you, Zach, in the sense that it did just kind of feel like a main event of SmackDown. It was a very good match, but the payoff did kind of fall flat a bit. I do think it's undisputedly the end of their feud and their program, because if you realize they didn't even have an interaction in the Rumble, I think Corbin was out by the time. I think they are officially done with it. You know, as a whole, I didn't mind this this uh, program between the two of them. I feel like Baron Corbin has slowly started to find his own here. And, but it just, I hope that it's not a one and done with him. You know, we've seen it many times where, like, you know, they push a guy heavily and then that's it and good night delights. I think that there's a place for Corbin beyond Roman Reigns. I thought maybe if he could get back in the scene of the Intercontinental Championship picture. But, I mean, all in all, I wasn't you know, enthralled with the match. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't something that I was expecting after months and months to be the payoff. Wow. So, uh, wow, we, we, we agree or disagree on some of these opinions, which is good. And and Mary seems to definitely be the uh, the, the protagonist in, in terms of loving, liking this match much more than the rest of us did. But um, 
again, I think it's because maybe that the rest of the Royal Rumble was so damn good. Also, um, we look back at in retrospective, you know, when you stack the matches up, this one was just kind of like, eh, it's kind of ho hum. And and I understand that you know this is truly a full falls count anywhere match. It certainly was, and they lived up to that stipulation, no doubt. Um, but it kind of also made Roman Reigns, while he did win, the fact that he had the ability to make any stipulation in the world, and he decides, with all the interference that he's that he's been dealing with over the past few months, he decides to have a false Ken Anywhere match in which he could be outnumbered easily, even if the Usos come to his aid. He, you know, Baron Corbin's got a lot of other men at his disposal. Um, Instead of deciding to say, hey, let's put ourselves in a cage match where it's just you and I and there can be no interference. And yeah, there can be interference in cage matches, but at least the logic would be there to not make him look like a doofus for, for basically making the stipulation that would open him up to be the most exposed to outside interference. But nonetheless, um, it, it was an okay match, and I think that they have moved on. And the real test here is going to be for Rowan Reigns as a babyface. He has now eliminated Edge from the Royal Rumble again. Uh, Edge was really meant to go into a program with Randy Orton, which we've now seen, and, and that's fine. But we've, I don't know, if I was WWE, I'd be starting to be a bit concerned about this Roman Reigns babyface character that they've done so well with over the last year of mitigating booze. Um, with him eliminating Edge, uh, he's now out of the program with Baron Corbin. He gets into the program presumably with The Fiend. We haven't seen it. Again, I, I hate that it's still presumption. But where does Roman Reigns go after this program into, you know, from somebody that the crowd organically and truly dislikes of Baron Corbin into somebody maybe that is, isn't as disliked? Does the Roman Reigns uh, factor, does the Roman Reigns fever or sickness come back to the fans and they say, you know, oh, yeah, this is why I don't like this guy. That's right. He was with Corbin for a while out of the title picture, doing his own thing, comes back from cancer. Yay, everyone's happy for him. And then he gets shoved into a program with somebody, maybe The Fiend, or maybe a month or so away from that. But maybe the feelings are starting to come back, and uh, we're, we're contracting the coronavirus and going, hey, uh, yeah, this is why we don't like Roman Reigns. Could you see maybe some regression in, in uh, crowd response? We'll get our answer maybe Friday night, but what do you guys think? I think you muted yourself, Mary. It keeps remuting me. I'm sorry. That's I don't know right. how to use a computer. It's 2020. Uh, <laughs> um, there's a couple of things. Like, as far as the card goes, I still think the Bailey match was worse than this match. Uh, the Bailey match did absolutely nothing for me. Agreed. Agreed. My, my personal opinion, as much as Lacey Evans has kind of grown in the last couple of months, she was still super sloppy. It was really quick. And I, I, I knew that Lacey wasn't going over. Like, there was no way that Lacey was winning that title. And that's why, like, the whole Sasha thing that we talked about earlier was just, you know, preposterous. Like, I was just dumbfounded because I didn't know where she was. Um, as far as Roman with the, with the baby face stuff, it's like now that we got Drew McIntyre, I think there is more leg room for... Uh, if this faction continues with the Usos for him to go heel, I, I mean, it goes back to the CHT, the Cena heel turn. I know everybody wants it and it's never happened, but they've kind of found somebody in Drew McIntyre where they don't really need. That's why I like this whole you guys talking about Fiend and, and Roman Reigns. I know that like he hasn't been like in the he hasn't been in the main event picture. I know he's a main eventer, but he hasn't been in the title picture. They kind of drew him back because they he they knew they damaged him so much and they're rebuilding him up. But now they have this Drew McIntyre thing going on and like everything changes on a fly. Like look at Daniel Bryan; he is the best example of all of this. They tried so hard to get the crowd not to like him. Now I feel like with you got Drew McIntyre doing this thing right now where people are behind him and they did it right. They they did it right. And the crowd is hot for him. You know, the, I don't know where Roman goes from here. I don't know where Daniel Bryan goes after the Fiend thing, too. You know, and Daniel Bryan is now, again, one of the top baby faces. I don't necessarily think that there isn't wiggle room. And especially because now you're starting to see this rumble totally showed Paul Heyman's hands in it. You know, and now you have Paul Heyman in, in the picture. So I don't know. I don't know where Roman is going, but I... 
again, I still think that, you know, the Usos have that gimmick going on where they're kind of fan favorites, but at the drop of a dime, they are able to be the bad guys because of their persona and how they act. So who's to say that, like, Roman finally doesn't give in to the dark side? I don't know where they're going with him. This is me being conspiracy theory married, which we won't even talk about my predictions. But, you know, I, I, I see a lot of movement for this. I think this was the blow off. I don't think the Corbin thing is going to go on anymore. But now what do you do with Roman? And if it is the Fiend, again, I just don't see it because he just hasn't been involved in that scene. And if he does get involved with him, I just feel like it's kind of like, the safe choice like oh well Roman's you know the fighter and and all that stuff so I, I I I have mixed opinions about it but now that they have other people emerging kind of picking up that torch that are better because Roman still gets a meh reaction I mean it's better than it was I mean I was watching 2015 Rumble and the booze woo when it started it started and it didn't stop until he got sick which is unfortunate but I think there's a lot of wiggle room to put Roman in something else, uh, but I don't know exactly what it is. But that's, you know, my opinion, my outtake, my fantasy booking, what have you. I think there is room, if he sticks with the Usos, for them to kind of become a dominant, you know, heel faction. Yeah, and I, I can completely agree with that. I could definitely see them going that direction. There's one particular video I saw a while back of it was the, the Usos and Roman in a very clearly inebriated state. And seeing him actually be organically Roman and, and having a personality was great. It was nice to see him not be this kind of forced superhero. And I think that leaning into the heel turn and allowing him to actually be himself more is the right direction to go. And I think there's tons of programs they could run. You know, I think it, everything that happened in the Royal Rumble seemed to have a particular reason behind it. And I know that there were some changes towards the end of it with AJ Styles getting injured, but I really feel like Roman Reigns eliminating Edge was a calculated move. And I see them eventually facing off in a basic way of, uh, you know, taking the face energy, the crowd loving Edge returning so much and using that to really, you know, blow off this heel turn for Roman and really make it as effective as possible. And I think that perfectly will lead into a potential Fiend uh, matchup at WrestleMania and make it make a lot more sense and kind of start to shift the pieces around so it, it seems to be a little bit more sensical and you could have the Fiend play off of him trying to heal the, uh, not to be, uh, have a pun there, but, you know, try to heal the heel Roman and, and, you know, try and make him back into the baby face he was. So I think there's a lot of room there for, for this to grow. And I think that it definitely makes a lot of sense to finally pull the trigger on the, on the Reigns heel turn. Everything you guys said would be awesome. And I'm sure Matt would agree with it. You know, I think he opens the show with him saying, why don't they turn Roman heel already? But it's not going to happen. And, you know, aside from the fact that we just know Vince McMahon is stubborn, that he'll keep him there, just look at the SmackDown roster. Who's the next babyface that could possibly challenge the Fiend for the belt? Braun Strowman? I don't think he's close to that. They've already done Daniel Bryan. The Miz just turned heel. Like, who could it be? The answer is Roman Reigns. It's unfortunate, but it seems like they are on an inevitable collision course together just based on the fact that there are no top-level baby faces on SmackDown for The Fiend to go up against beyond Roman Reigns. Like, maybe in time they could build a Mustafa Ali up there, and maybe Braun Strowman could get back to that level. But, you know, especially given the fact that Kofi Kingston is back in, and in my opinion, rightfully back in the tag team title picture, I just don't see any way around beyond Roman Reigns and and uh, The Fiend locking up at WrestleMania, let alone a Reigns heel turn. I think that, you know, they tested the waters at uh, Royal Rumble, and he would have gotten heavily booed had he been the winner, but I don't think that that's going to change the course that he is on with The Fiend at WrestleMania, and probably is going to ultimately end up winning the Universal Championship. I've just kind of devoid myself of pretending that WWE is going to turn him heel again, or again, ever, because 
the fact is that they have had a zillion awesome opportunities, and I've been booking him heel for the last five years since uh, really Rumble of 2015 in Philly. And ever since then, I mean, imagine if he had that night come out after he won the Rumble, stood on the second rope, they called an audible, and he just flipped off the crowd. Imagine the heat. It would have been it would have been nuclear heat, right? It would have been you know Monday Night Raw after he beat the Undertaker at WrestleMania 33 heat, where they just basically said "f you, Rome" and like all that stuff, and he stood there for 15 minutes, and the crowd buried him. And again, I, I'm not even going to go down that road. I've been down the road so many times. I, I feel like I've made the road and, and paved it. Like I, I'm done with it. Uh, until it actually happens, I'm not going to believe it. If it happens, I will. You know, first of all, I'm going to applaud them. But the second of all, I'm going to say, you know how much money you missed out in the last five years, right? Like, okay, you're doing it, but is it too little, too late? Um, so anyway, we have a couple Wait, more matches. Can I yeah, really yeah, yeah. Quick? Sure. <laughs> Okay, so um, if if Roman and Wyatt are an in, inevitable battle at WrestleMania, and I'm not, again, you guys could be 100% right, and I would not say I was wrong. Why is the ultimate thing that Roman's going to win? Like, why, who's to say they don't keep going with Wyatt? And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and what has happened with every opponent that, Ro- that Wyatt has faced? Have they turned? They've changed. Other so than who's to say that that isn't the that isn't the the angle that they are running at? It could be. I mean, that would be genius. I would I, look. Uh, that is that seems to I be. I can't. The, I'm implied. sorry, not to tell you off again. I can't believe that Roman is going to. I mean, again, I've been wrong about Roman a zillion times, but I can't see that Roman is the guy to defeat the Fiend. I just, I don't see it. I can see them having a WrestleMania match. I can see them having a title defense. That's sure. But wouldn't it make more sense that, like, everybody's been pushing for this, and if they're listening to people, and they're kind, it seems right now that they're doing smart things, every guy that that guy has faced has turned the opposite of what they were. So it's a perfect opportunity for them to turn Roman if he loses to The Fiend at WrestleMania. And opponents for The Fiend, you have Aleister Black, who could come out of nowhere if you're going the supernatural route. That guy knows about the occult. Maybe he'll go after him. And you still have The Undertaker, even though we don't want to bring that up. Okay, I'm done. (laughs) Good observation, though. The the Fiend is, that has been kind of the side effect of facing The Fiend. Everyone has changed. Even Daniel Bryan has said, you know, uh, and he has changed, too. I mean, that's where he uh, he got his first real babyface, return to babyface program. And, yeah, we knew with Finn Balor. Uh, obviously, that was well documented where he he turned heel, right? Um, and so that could be the ultimate destination for WWE because fans right now the the overwhelming belief is that it is Roman. It's it's the Fiend. It's at WrestleMania and it's for the championship and Roman wins. Well, maybe we get to Roman versus the Fiend, but the ultimate goal is to not have Roman win, but to maybe in a loss turn his. Um, turn his character to the dark side i mean because that's what the goal of the fiend is and uh, i don't know what do you guys think about that proposition yeah um, i i oh go right ahead anthony oh sorry about that buddy um look uh, i think it would be fantastic i just i don't think there is really a point and i hope i'm wrong i just don't see there being a point into even investing ourselves into such a Storyline. I'd be willing to bet a hundred bucks Canadian on the fact that Roman Reigns will walk out of WrestleMania 36 as the Universal Champion. I think that it's taken Vince McMahon everything in his human power to hold back on putting the world title right back around Roman's waist when he returned about a year ago. Because remember, he relinquished the Universal Championship. He never actually lost it, and he had regained it, and had only had it for about two months after not being world champion for almost two years. So I, I just think that they, the way they booked him over the last calendar year, you know, very sheltered opponents. You know, he returned uh, last year, forming with the Shield almost right out of the gate. Then he went up against uh, Shane McMahon and was standing side by side with The Undertaker and had that feud for 
almost the whole summer. Then he had the who done it angle, which ultimately uh, he wound up at the side of Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan's never getting get booed, so more cheers behind Roman. And then he went up against Baron Corbin, who's arguably the most hated heel in the company right now. So he got cheered too. It just seems that it's been calculated booking by WWE and good booking. And to their credit, they've got they've made a lot of progress with Roman Reigns by keeping him somewhat on the back burner out of the world title picture. But you just see the way that they've smartly booked him, got the crowd to kind of slowly but surely get more behind them that I just can't see any other scenario of him not conquering the Fiend because, yeah, there's Aleister Black, and but he's on Raw right now, but I'm sure they could bring him over in, in, a, um, in a superstar shakeup or what have you, but I just don't see a way how Roman Reigns is in world champion come post-WrestleMania 36. Yeah, and I, I can agree with you a lot on that, Anthony. I do see that that's kind of the direction that they're they're going towards is eventually having Reigns have the belt again. Because like you said, they kind of have sheltered him back and, or in you know, or the Fiend rather sheltered back. And I think that in this case, it makes a lot of sense to build it. But I think because of what WWE has been doing more recently, the trend of kind of switching away from popular belief, as you know, a lot of people had Roman Reigns predicted as the winner. The plans were originally to have Roman Reigns be the victor here. I think that that kind of spells to them building towards something a little bit bigger than just the obvious. And I think that if they do kind of Pull, finally pull the trigger on the heel turn that it would make sense because really this idea of trying to make the fiend a heel hasn't worked either so you know leaning into that a little bit and saying okay we're, we're going to completely switch the roles on you before wrestlemania and we're going to have you uh you know cheering for bray wyatt you know maybe trying to lean into healing people as opposed to hurting them now or you know maybe he comes out as sweater bray wyatt or you know mr rogers bray wyatt however you want to term that uh, side of him, but I could definitely see them going a lot of different ways to kind of go away from the obvious, and I think a lot of people have it predicted, like you said, that it, it Roman Reigns is going to walk out of there with the belt, which could definitely still feels like the the right move and kind of, maybe not the right move but kind of the writing on the wall so I think if they switch up the roles it'll make it a lot more interesting before then all right well um what I'd like to do is um just touch on these last two matches and then I'll give you guys a chance to talk about anything else maybe we didn't want to or didn't cover in terms of the Rumble um, and any other final thoughts. But um, the last two matches, I'm grouping them together because the one match, honestly, <laughs> with uh, with um, uh, Lacey Evans and Bailey is not really worth too much of a discussion because it was just kind of a by-the-numbers type of match. It was very standard. Um, it, it kind of felt like kind of a, a bit of a, a break in terms of the pacing of the show. Um, that's not to say this was a bad match. Like there were no real bad matches on the show. I don't think there was one. Um, but this one wasn't really particularly exciting. Um, Bailey wins, and I think that's still the right move. Some people thought that it was you know Lacey Evans' time, and they are certainly heavy handing this military connection and she's a mom so we're all supposed to relate with her and i'm starting to come around to her character it's it's taking some time um but again i, I don't have a whole lot to say about that match other than right booking just kind of a average match it was what it was and bailey came out on top as she should have um and then the other match was becky lynch versus oscar that match i loved it um, that really was, to me, the, clearly <laughs> the, the superior women's match of the show, outside of the Rumble, of course. But Becky Lynch here, um, she collected her debt, as she said. She had Asuka tap out. Um, as Asuka was about to, to dispense the green mist, she kicks her. The, the mist goes all over Asuka's face, of which apparently she's immune and didn't really react to. Nonetheless, um, we had Becky Lynch tap her out. Uh, there were some great spots in that match. These two, anytime that they want to give them 20 minutes to go, it's going to be a good day in the ring. Um, I loved it. I think that these two tore it up. Um, Becky Lynch winning was the right move. It would have made no sense to drop the belt to Oscar, who's also the women's tag team half half of the women's tag team champions. So uh, the right move here, but it certainly got me emotionally invested. 
Um, Asuka, to me, is doing some of the best work she's done since she dropped the belt last year to Charlotte inexplicably on SmackDown. We all know how I feel about that before WrestleMania and then didn't give a damn. Um, so to me, this is the best that she's been position wise. She feels more comfortable on the mic. I'm actually getting a, a little bit charmed by her yelling in Japanese every week. It's weird. Even though I don't understand her, it's, she's just so cartoonish and over the top. It, it, she's so bad that she's good on the mic. It's weird. I don't know how to feel about it in, in the ring. There's no question. She's off the charts, but just performance wise on the mic it's she's just so bad it's good um and i think she's reached that level and she seems more comfortable too so um again becky and 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 um and um <clears throat> becky and oscar certainly tore it up and then lacy and, and uh, bailey kind of just there would you what did you think mary um i agree with like most of everything you said the bailey lacy match came off like it felt like a filler match to me and i know it was for the world title but it just kind of felt like a, a rest match for everything else that was going on the card it was the the lead it was a good match i'm not saying it wasn't it was just the bottom match for me um I like that they changed Lacey's character. It's working better for her going the military route and being the mom because I I didn't want to pay attention to her whatsoever when she was doing the heel gimmick. Um, and Bailey's Bailey, you know, like it, it, it was a good match, but it wasn't, you know, the show stealer of the show. Uh, Becky Asuka was awesome. I love the kick and the miss going into the air. And I also like that, you know, even though she lost to Becky, I wanted her to win. I thought she was going to win because I thought that was going to be the end of the title reign for Becky. Obviously, it's coming after Mania. Who knows? Um, but I I just like the fact that she lost. And the next night she was on Raw and she was challenging, you know, Charlotte and trying to pay her dues, you know, that like. She basically, even though you couldn't understand her in Japanese, she's basically saying, you screwed me out of my stuff last year and that wasn't right and I would have beaten you if I was in the rumble you know because she won the rumble and then you know didn't they end up having a triple threat with her like she didn't really get like her shot or Rousey came out and it completely you know disregarded her win so um I I enjoyed the match I thought it was a really good match on both of them um, I liked everything about it, but I, I really liked that. It wasn't just like, oh, Becky beat her, and now she's getting thrown to the side, and she's not being taken seriously as a serious hitter in the women's division, and they still have her right there with Charlotte. Yeah, I, I agree with you on a lot of points there, Mary. I think that ultimately um, on the on the first match side of things with Lacey Evans versus Bailey, I, I felt like really to sell the face turn of Lacey Evans, I felt like this was the right time to pull the trigger and maybe set up a potential mania feud uh, that had a slow burn between Bailey and Lacey with her taking the belt and going this face route and kind of, uh, you know, being the polar opposite of Bailey's story where she's going heel and she became champion, you know, having Lacey Evans turn face and become champion would be kind of this good contrasting storyline to build upon to Mania, but not having her win the belt here, it just kind of feels like, well, you know, she she tried, but she couldn't beat her. And although, you know, there it was some cheating involved and things like that, I felt like it just felt... Re- fell really flat because there had no reason to really be invested. You felt like Bailey was going to come out the victor and she did because it was kind of too short of a feud to, to have it go any other way. But I think, you know, with her momentum turning face, I think they've uh, squandered a lot of the momentum Bailey had when she turned heel. So I thought that they would have kind of learned and tried to pull the trigger a little bit more with Lacey Evans. So I, I would have liked to have seen her walk out as champion, but I understand why not. And I think it ended up kind of being a poor match. I wouldn't even go as far as to say it was that good. It just didn't, it felt very out of place on an otherwise very good card. Uh, So, but on the polar opposite of that, again, would be the uh, Asuka and Becky match, which I thought really tore it down. And, you know, to your point too, Matt, with Asuka on the microphone, it reminds me a lot of uh, Tajiri when he was doing his run in the WWE. And, you know, of, of course, sharing the green mist as a parallel there too, which is, 
he does it. It feels like she has no reason to need to speak it. And it's like, she's above it. And it kind of helps sell that heel side of her too. So I, I, and I thought this match between them was excellent. I thought, like you said, Mary, the finish with the kick to the gut and the, and the mist was excellent. And I, I just think that they're doing a lot of right things uh, with everything, but I think that Asuka is someone that they've kind of gotten wrong in a lot of ways, but this match was very good, and I think that they should continue to build something towards her getting a title in the very near future, however they can achieve that. Yeah, both of these matches, well, obviously the Lacey evans Bailey one fell flat. It was not the worst thing and like i really like it lacey evans so i'm kind of being a bit biased but it wasn't anything more than a placeholder match and while the oscar and becky match were significantly better it still just felt like a placeholder match for waiting for becky to gain engaged in bigger and better things you know i found they did a really good build to the becky and uh, oscar match contrary to the one on the smackdown side of things I'm interested to see where they go beyond this on both for both championships. I think it was the payoff for both championships with both um, uh, women's champions retaining the titles clean. I'm hoping on the SmackDown side of things, it's it's uh, Alexa Bliss. And I think it may be almost set in stone. That will be Shayna Baszler on the side of Raw. So I'm anxious to see where they go uh, beyond uh, these feuds from now. I am too, and I hope Alexa Bliss gets more of a prominent position. She had a nice showing at the Royal Rumble, uh, which was promising. Um, and like you said, I mean, she was the face of Raw like, not too long ago, and obviously Ronda Rousey came and dethroned her pretty quickly. Um, but I, I think, yeah, Alexa Bliss, it, it's time to kind of position her more as an actual main event, consistent main event um, star because she is just that I'm tired of the five feet of fury and you know I remember when she first was called up they were kind of just knacking on her for her height and it's like yeah, come on guy I mean even the announcers were talking about she's only five feet and five feet of fury I don't you know I don't need that um, and, and so nonetheless I think that Alexa Bliss is in for a potentially big 2020 year um, and, and I hope that she is but uh, so I think we're all are kind of in agreement on the Becky Lynch and Oscar match tore it down uh, certainly was the the star of the women's show other than the rumble um but yeah bailey and um ba bailey and uh um oh my gosh i'm like losing it because it's so late uh, which we got, <laughs> Lacey, geez. sorry guys like my bedtime is like usually right around now but that's okay it's it's uh it's rumble review time so uh yeah lacy is a girl, a, a woman that is is really they're trying to transition her into this believable and relatable, and, and they hit all this military stuff from the audience at least on a uh, on air type of presentation because they were trying to get the military background to obviously use that as a as a uh, well, we're, well you know we'll talk about this when you turn babyface makes total sense right I mean you don't want to boo a veteran typically so um, <clears throat> anyway I, I think there is a big year also involved for Lacey Evans and I think this was a test for her at the pay-per-view and I think that she she somewhat passed the test uh, you know she is not the greatest in-ring performer of all time but she's still somewhat new she's a little bit green that's fine um and you know it takes time to get into the you, you know feel out like your chemistry with your opponent and if she had more matches down the line with bailey they should in theory and in using your logic should be better so we'll have to see about that we'll have to see if Lacey just kind of fades into the background after this um certainly friday night on smackdown will tell us whether or not that she's going to remain in the title picture or just kind of goes by the wayside and we get some new contenders uh, which I kind of think is more likely to happen. So uh, any final comments on the women before we move on? Nope. All right. Well, so I'll just kind of open up the floor then. Is there anything uh, th that maybe you guys didn't wanted to expand upon or that I didn't touch on or any kind of final thoughts on the Rumble and Raw from last night? Um, well, obviously, the Edge and Randy Orton storyline going forward, I mean, that's the biggest thing that happened in the last 48 hours other than the Rumble. So um, what's your thoughts on it, Matt? Oh, all right. Well, uh, my thoughts are I liked it. I, I really what I really loved 
was not just Randy Orton um, and his his just the way that he did it so methodically and him teasing getting RK rated RKO back, which is kind of ironic, by the way, that Edge is the rated R superstar in a PG television environment, right? So he's not really, he's kind of like the neutered rated R superstar, the wannabe, right? Because it, it just doesn't make sense. But I'm, I love the nickname. I love everything about Edge. Uh, so I love the way that Randy Orton came down. He teased the reunion and gave him a hug and then boom, RKO, puts him down. And then he took his time getting the chair positioning the chair and then eventually you know you're thinking oh someone gonna come out and save him someone gonna come out and save him nobody comes out and saves him which is kind of uh, uh i don't know i'm fine with it because you have to put a program together for these two but it's from in turn like logically like there's no one backstage then randy orton's taking his time and you know he has a triple fusion neck surgery no one's gonna come out to potentially save him whatever i'm not i'm not getting on that point but but i love the way that they presented this randy orton hitting the concerto on Randy on on Edge Edge the way that he sold it this is the other part of it the the facials from Edge when he first got RKO'd was like what just happened and you're concerned about his neck he looked like he was concerned about his neck as almost as if you could read through his eyes of what his thoughts were um, I, I loved it I think this is a great first program for Edge uh, from what I'm reading he signed a three year contract with WWE I think he's in it for the long haul he could have a resurrected Michaels career um, of you know what Shawn Michaels did in 2002 coming back I hope that's the case I loved his promo though at the beginning saying I wanted to end this on my terms I didn't want to go through my life saying what if uh, everything was done right Edge reminded us that he is what he says he is and I, I loved everything about this segment I mean I can't say enough about it it put instant heat on Randy Orton a guy that has been getting over even as a heel because of his RKO I think that's going to finally change now that you have Edge on the other side of the the um, coin with this program. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, do I think this is going to lead all the way to WrestleMania? It could. I was I would love to pair Edge up with Seth Rollins, but if this leads all the way to WrestleMania, there's a lot to pull from. There's a ton of history with these two. So I don't know. I'd give the the ending of this an A plus all the way around. Um, yeah, uh, every, everything you said was, um, spot on. Um, even though, you know, Edge was clearly clear to be in that ring, he was in the rumble. I mean, he was doing spears and he's in the best shape of his life. I mean, he's a little grayer, like you said, but he looked fantastic on Sunday night. Um, it was the most unsettling thing I've watched on professional wrestling in a long time like I was invested I knew everything was okay and they wouldn't be doing this to him if he could legitimately like get injured or re-hurt his neck or his spine or anything like that but I had my hands over my face you know over my nose and my hands the whole time I was watching it and I was just uncomfortable watching it and I I was screaming at the tv going Randy don't do it you know and we all know that Randy is that snake and that's what he does and I don't know what Brandy's reasoning is going to be when he comes out and says it. I mean, sometimes he doesn't give an answer for his actions. You know, it could be jealousy that he stole the spotlight, you know, and that like he's gotten all these accolades since he's retired and he's a Hall of Famer, but you know, Randy's the legend killer. Um, it's the first real, I mean, we've been talking about Randy being good the last couple of months and when he's good, he's compelling. And sometimes he's just one of those filler or in stop pause mode or, you know, you don't really know what they're doing with him, but when they put him in this villain role and they give him a dance partner that he wants, he can literally make you hate him on the drop of a dime. And like, even when he was holding him and like, and, and, and like kind of coddling him that he hated himself for doing this. Cause this was his best friend that dragged him out of the, you know, the lowest ditch he was in, in his life when Randy was having all those problems, it was just, it was perfecto. It was, it was a plus. There's no better person for edge to come back to the WWE and revise his career with other than old guard. And that's Randy Orton still, even though, you know, Randy's really never been out with injuries and stuff like that. It's kind of, you know, I'm just happy, but this is the most compelling storyline that I think Randy has had since when he was doing the, the punk kicks to people's heads. 
Um, and I just wanted to praise it on both of them. It was good. And Edge was like, let's do it and let's let's sell it. And, and he did. It, it was fantastic. Yeah, I, I completely agree to your points, too, Mary. I think that, you know, everything that they've done with this storyline has been great. And I think that it's really a, a program with a lot to build upon, as you said, Matt. And I think that it's something that is very, um, it, although it's using older stars, it feels very much like forward progress for WWE in a lot of ways where it's giving us a lot of what we want in the sense of we wanted Edge to return in a big way and have a big uh something big to come back to so and like you said too mary about the stop and go at nature of randy orton giving him a big person to go after just felt like all the right moves and i think that uh, that can be said a lot about the forward progress leading off of royal rumble i think that they're leaning towards a lot of really great things and it's very encouraging stuff and it's always the best time of year going into mania but it feels like they're making a lot of the right moves which i think is the biggest takeaway for me from the rumble and this episode of raw yeah, I just think Randy Orton is a good guy to pair Edge up with to, you know, break him back into things. They have a, you know, a history to play off of. Randy Orton's basically a ring general in there, could have a, you know, a five-star match with a broomstick, so he can help Edge along if there is any ring rust, even though it didn't seem to be the case at the Rumble. And, you know, to your point, Matt, they could, you know, uh, not string this out to WrestleMania and have Edge, you know, just have be a st- or have Randy Orton be a stepping stone for Edge to, on the way to WrestleMania. You know, I think they have two pay per views between now and then, so a lot of things can happen. All I know is that this is a good pay per view for these or pay per view, a good program for these two to get involved in with one another, and I'm really excited to see where they go with it. Yeah, I am too. Um... And, you know, I'm thinking back to what the reasoning could be, what we'll hear from Randy, and, well, Edge got eliminated, or uh, Orton got eliminated by Edge in the Royal Rumble. There's something there. Uh, There's also a comment that was made when Randy Randy Orton feigned an injury a number of weeks ago to to, um, lure in AJ Styles, ultimately to hit an RKO. He mentioned Edge in his promo that, uh, you know, I knew a guy, Edge, and he had to end his career, and he paralleled his speech to kind of uh, edges from nine years ago. So that was, I think, definitely by design for sure. So uh, I, I'm well looking forward to this program. Do I want it to string out another three months, ten weeks? Uh, probably not. I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't be a great program, but again, I'd love to see Seth Rollins with his group versus Edge and I think there's a lot there, but again, uh, I, I mean, we're, we're kind of fantasy booking given the fact that we don't even know what's going to be on the, the Super Showdown or the Elimination Chamber uh, matchup. So uh, this is all just you know, kind of conjecture at this point, but I really think that uh, this, this is going to be a program, regardless of where it ends or how quick it is or how long it is, it's going to be an enjoyable program. These are two professionals, um, one at the top of his game, one getting back into the game, but doesn't look like he's missed a step. This is going to be enjoyable. Enjoyable all the way around. So, um, any last thoughts on anything, guys, before we uh, kind of ride off into the sunset? I think I'm good. I'll bring up my conspiracy theories that got squashed another time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I think I covered just about everything on my end, too. Awesome. Well, guys, this has been super enjoyable. I've, I've, this is awesome. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for joining me, Zach, uh, for, for filling in for Ashley. Um, and, you know, maybe we can redo this for the, the WrestleMania show or, or, you know, maybe make this a kind of an annual pay-per-view thing. We'll, we'll see. But uh, this has been a lot of fun, and I want to thank you guys for staying up so damn late. Or, or I don't really know what you guys' bedtimes are, but uh, certainly devoting a significant amount of time to coming on and talking wrestling. Thank you. I'm about to go get tacos. This isn't my bedtime yet. <laughs> tacos? Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm jealous. Were you like Taco Bell tacos? Yeah, Taco or... Bell. Taco Bell is like ah, seven yeah. minutes from my house. That's what I'm doing right after this. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't, want, I don't want to keep you from Taco Bell. Uh, so, um, but Anthony and Zach, thank you to, uh, for, for popping on. And uh, we will be in touch shortly as well. And uh, uh, definitely, Zach, thank you for, for your AEW reviews. You've been doing awesome. So thank you. Uh, all the way around. 
Thank you, Matt. And and it was a pleasure working with you guys, and I definitely would love to get back on and do this again. For sure. No, definitely. Uh, like I said, maybe we'll make this more of a, a consistent thing. So um, stay tuned. Um, yeah, and, it was really uh, enjoyable talking to you guys. I'm so happy that we formally met through uh, Skype tonight. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I know. Well, that's how you meet people now, right? Like, that's how you meet. I actually met my wife on Match. Like, so, um, and actually, it's funny. I, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but we met on Match, but then on, on Tinder, we actually matched on Tinder at the same time, and she ignored me on Tinder, and, like, and I was like, what the hell? Like, why are you ignoring me? <laughs> like, we laugh about that now, but she completely blew me off on Tinder. And I was like, hey, what are you doing? And she, like, didn't respond. And, like, so we just laugh about it now. But we actually officially met on Match. So, yeah, this, that's how you meet people now, right? So. Yeah, that's funny. Me and my fiance met through AIM first and then through Facebook. So, I mean, we've got pretty pretty similar parallels going on there. <laughs> oh, no way. AIM? Oh, my God. Yeah, going oh, really funny. throwback there when AIM was still the, the place to be when you're trying to meet people <laughs> and you have your, yeah when you do you put like a uh, notification when your crush would come on mine was like a cash register or something and then oh she's online right uh, you have a way messages and stuff oh i remember that yeah the good oh, old God. days of the internet <laughs> uh, i know the kid the kids will never know today they'll never know the struggles of flip phones and oh god all right well guys thank you so much for joining me it's been a blast and i will talk to all of you sometime down the line soon and so uh thanks again and enjoy the rest of your night enjoy your tacos mary i will i'm gonna get a lot right. of tacos <laughs> <laughs> bye guys have a good night guys you, good night you too good night hey guys so retirement may or may not be something that you're really thinking about but even if you are years and years away i mean i'm 20 years away from retirement but it's something that we should all be thinking about. There's a company that has retirement plans that you can invest in precious metals like gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. There's also a big opportunity to grow retirement and grow income for either your personal or, um, or a business. And anyone who signs up at this website receives a free investment kit and gift. So what is this website? It's brightmoneyinvestments.com. That's brightmoneyinvestments.com. You can diversify and grow with metals and cryptos, and you can even talk to someone there to get a better idea of what you should be investing in. So head on over to brightmoneyinvestments.com. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.